Hey, what is going on, guys? Happy Sunday to you. Hope you're having a fantastic week. Today is the AV experience, man. Excited to be with you guys. Jonathan, Ryan, what's happening, man? Jonathan got a new microphone. <laughs> I did, dude. Michael and Ryan blessed me with this. It's a nice little setup. So I, I really like just wanted like to see everybody to hear how terrible he really sounds in real life. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you, gentlemen. That was real yeah. nice of you. Dude, man, you well, you're, it was funny that your wife was just giving you so much crap about how badly you sounded. Yeah, That's she funny. was texting me last week when I was on in my regular seats, and she's like, "You just need to turn that off. I'm surprised <laughs> not to let you out of here." <laughs> so bad. Oh, <laughs> wife, making it rain. She's busting <laughs> shops, dude. Too cool, man. Yeah, it's always fun to get some new toys. I got a new toy. Haven't got it set up yet because I've been working on. What'd you I get? Just, I got a JVC NZ8. Welcome to the club. Yes, man. I've been eyeing that ever since M Wave 2022. So, first year, man, when we saw it, because I knew the NZ9 is out of reach for me for sure. What's up, Kyle? Good to see you, man. Newbie's in the house. I'll be at his house this week. We'll talk about that too. Um, but yeah, so I haven't had a chance to get that set up. So, really excited about that. Get on that. I know. But like I said, I, I've just got so many things going on. Excuses. Um, I still have a couple of videos for audio advice live. Just got went. I just posted one today. Um, 32 channel. Incredible, incredible, incredible system. Um, I think it's the first 32 channel system that I have reviewed or toured on my channel. So that was pretty wild. He has it set up to where he can actually move the speakers. What? There, yeah, literally, you adjust a couple. They're on um, rails of some sort. Yeah, I forgot what they call it. Unistruts, unis, mm -hmm. unistrat, unistrut, mm -hmm. something like that. So you undo literally two bolts, and you can slide them forward and backwards. And so he was really able to dial it in. He's you know just one of those nerdy guys like us, and just you know trying to make it perfection. But uh, but he's got a big big room, massive seventeen foot wide screen. I think it's two hundred twenty four inch diagonal. I mean. It's, Big old Joker, uh, Sony GTZ 380 projector, Mad VR, Kaleidoscape, beautiful seating. Wasn't your standard seating. They were kind of like a cream color. And he went with real nice seats in the middle. And then your kind of like your traditional local cinema seats in the front and in the rear. Like the but flip up seats. Yep. Yep. Um, 18 seats in this room, man. <laughs> God, dude, nice. I'm serious. It was cool though, man. Such a, so here was the cool thing. We started off with two channel and just listening to it. Now, I, what speakers were in there? JBL. Wisdom? Yeah, JBL, no, yeah. JBL okay. synthesis. They're okay. kind of like a 12 inch. Um, so the flare. flagship synth synthesis stuff, not yeah. the M2s. No, these are it's a number all like in wall seven. stuff. No, 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 like 1723s or something. Here, I'll pull them up. 1723 is Arendelle. I know, but it's it's like Do that. you even it's speaker, Michael? No, no, I don't. I don't. God. I don't know JBL's model numbers. All right. It is. Yeah, it's not Arendelle. It's 4367. I'll pull them up here. Link it. Not cheap either. Watch this. But man, he just he played those. Now I think I think I found out later, even after we did the video, that he might have had that kind of tied in with the 18 inch subwoofer mm. almost like a full range tower so they had more bottom end they weren't like massively explosive. interesting that he would have chosen those yeah they sounded phenomenal though really really interesting. great so older gentleman um loves music loves concerts loves home theater um the room is not your typical styling Mm -hmm. So you see the unistruts hanging down from the, you know, I mean, everything's kind of exposed, but he wanted to make it look like kind of resemble a rock concert. Mm -hmm. So even where his screen is, you see the, again, I don't know the technology or the technical term, but it's, he's like metal brackets going down to the floor to hold it up. But he wanted that, like he wanted everything to be, you know, not concealed. You can see the subwoofers on up front underneath really cool setup though. So yeah, man. But he just played two channel and I'm like, oh man, it was so enveloping. And mm. especially a big room like that. I was really surprised that it was able to do that with just two speakers. I mean, it literally wrapped around my head. I'm like, man, I could dig just handling this. 
-hmm. And then we went into some Atmos music, which was really cool. Again, he's got 10 Atmos speakers. He had 17 bed layer speakers. Three up front, 14 sides and, and rears. Five subwoofers. I mean, it was it was wild. But so, turn off processor or what processor is that? Turn off thirty two. Yep, he was running all thirty two channels. Um, just a great, great sound. Now, he he likes a very natural bass. So even with five subwoofers, it wasn't overbearing. I mean, you could feel it, um, especially during midway when they dropped the bomb onto the the aircraft carrier. You felt it. But it nothing like like what you guys are running or what I am. It wasn't a house curve. He really prefers just a flat response, and that's what's cool about home theaters. Well, tweak if, it. What subs is he using? <laughs> um, they're JBL sub 18s. I don't so think they'll dig that low, and they may not. But I'm just saying, like he doesn't. I mean, like I said, he his goal isn't infrasonics. It's not mass dry bass for the win. What's that? Dry bass for the win. Yes. <laughs> nothing wrong with it i mean yeah. if that's your yeah your like jam. i said it was it was a great sounding system though so for sure but yeah, glad I mean, you I enjoyed had, it i'll have to had watch a fun it time with that it's to me that's one of the the cool things is i get to hear people's stories mm -hmm. you know why they made the decisions and how they did this and um just a neat neat guy so that was that was fun but scott and i from audio advice uh, we did the kind of the video together on that the collaboration so a lot of fun man <laughs> good so scott newbie i see he's in the in the chat so i'll be flying up there this week ryan did you say you're going or no i am not i can okay. only do so much i get it man mm -hmm. um but yeah so that's happening friday and saturday maybe sunday i don't even know the exact dates i've got it on my calendar over here um but yeah so scott's getting ready he's got 50 people coming over to his home he does this once a year, throws out an open invitation, RSVP only. And once they fill up, they fill up. But I think, Scott, did you say, let us know in the chat. Did you say you had a couple of extras? Oh, no, he sold out. Okay. Or I know a couple people backed out just recently. and so Sold out would imply that he sold the tickets. Yeah. He's, he's out of space. Filled I should say up. Like that. Filled up. Yeah. yeah, that's probably more apt. Yeah. All, this, all, this, all the allotments are accounted for. How about that? So yeah, nice, very cool. The Villa Man, what's up, buddy? Good to see you, Cleveland. Hope you're doing well, man. Cleveland's got a new baby. Well, I say new baby. Cleveland, how old is your your baby? So last time I talked to him, we're trying to get him out to to uh, M Wave, and he's like, "Man, I got a new child." Good to see you, Ike. Lots of folks in the chat. Let me say hi to some folks. K Man, Adam. Good to see you, Tyler. SRW one thousand. Brian, what's up, buddy? Tarhoya, Ryan, Mark Fox, Bruce, 314 Carpenter, Siphonics Audio. Lots of folks, man. Howard, good to see you. Nicholas, Mike, bunch, a bunch of folks. The Villa Man, Z Big, what's up, buddy? Josh, good to see you. JD, the expert, is on time, man. <laughs> <laughs> he popped in last week. He's like, man, I'm late. He cracks me up, dude. He gets so excited on this, so. But yeah, man, just having some fun. So yeah, lots and lots of fun stuff happening. I've got, like I said, I've got quite a bit of things in for review. So I've got to get those. But I've got this trip coming up with Scott Newby. And then two weeks after that, we've got Cedia going on. So Ugh. very cool. <laughs> Don't Appreciate remind it. me. What? So she has a lot of work. You get to go just enjoy stuff. I get to go build crap. Hey, I chose my job, man, and you did too, so doesn't mean i can't dislike it <laughs> true yeah yeah nicholas the 50 inch sub video blew up so yeah that was crazy man so we had a chance we talked about it on the last stream that went to audio advice live and had a 50 inch subwoofer and i still need to make a video on it was that. okay yeah <laughs> that whole experience was just okay yeah that's why ryan just <laughs> ordered that whole system i have not yet <laughs> he's Totally tempted though. Did you guys go stand next to that fifty inch? Just stand right in front of it. Oh yeah, yeah. Feel it didn't feel like. look like you had to. You could be right in front of it, and it could be hammering. Yeah, wow. and you could loose. not tell it was on. Yeah, what barely, you had to reach out and touch it. Seriously, it's oh, barely, you mean because it just wasn't. I, you couldn't see it. It didn't need to. There it's didn't need to be any excursion. Like it. And the whole daggum room is shaking. You know, so much surface area. The back glasses go wah 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 from. 
how much pressure in the room was horrific, yeah. but it, the speakers and the sub still did a really, really good job. Yeah. So and that's Jeffrey because we've always joked about that being like the ultimate near field, but it wouldn't be in that instance, right? Because you're not getting a whole lot more being immediately than you were anywhere else in the room. It sounds like because it's just yeah. not, it's not oh. moving the air that much right there. One thing that was interesting about that room is you walk around the whole room and it, it was, was very I mean, was similar. No, yeah. There was no deviation in the base, which was really interesting. It was just pushing this big wave at you. Ah, right? it's <laughs> enormous. Yeah. Um, but it's hmm. I can't use the wah because that implies that it didn't sound clean. I mean, it sounded wow, butter good. smooth. It was so <laughs> good. Yeah. So good. I mean, you had the guy from Sonus Faber, uh, Will Klein. And I mean, he's just like, and Will knows music. He knows good music. Great dude. And dude, he's grinning from ear to ear, just going, man, I like this. <laughs> it was good stuff. And he was cranking it in the second floor, too. So fun stuff, man. Well, cool deal. So, guys, if you got questions, drop those in the chat. So we will be answering your home theater questions. Uh, Super Chats, of course, get priority, but definitely not required. Um, oh, should we tell them what we just talked about before? Well, the, you just kind of implied that something's important. So that's like walking up to the kid and be like, you want to know a secret? And then thinking that they're not going <laughs> to. All right. All right. All right. So we do have new dates for. We don't have tickets available yet, but. M Wave 2024, mark down the dates June 21st through the 23rd via Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we will still be at the Kansas City Convention Center. Yep. We were looking at moving it possibly to a hotel, but honestly, guys, I tried. This year is just not the year. Um, it's super expensive. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to basically say, hey, look, we want to rent this thing out. Well, and that's the money, sketchy, the money is something, but I'm not, that's not the primary thing. The primary thing is whatever, dude. <laughs> conduciveness to making the event make sense. The, yeah. the Kansas City Convention Center has so many things going for it. One is that the rooms are large, but they're not like enormous. They're big, but they're not, you know, they're big yeah, convention but... space large. The other big thing that it's got going for it is the rooms are treated. Now it's not like home theater level professional level home like treatments but it's much better than if you go into most spaces like if i clap in most of those spaces and i went to a bunch That's of true. different hotel rooms events like not hotel rooms hotels and event spaces mm -hmm. and a lot of them are just horrific yeah so sure. the kansas city convention center those rooms do actually very very well mm -hmm. for what they are yeah. And a lot of the vendors were like, this is the best sounding room we've ever done something in, which is saying something because they've mm -hmm. done a lot in a lot of different spaces. So it's it's too much to walk away from, I think. Uh, and we're a little bit limited on the number of rooms. I think we can get up to 17 or 18 different rooms and mm -hmm. some people say we'll get another wing there is no other wing i mean there's other rooms but they're 2,000 and 3,000 square feet which is just too large yeah so we're kind of limited i'm trying to figure out ways to do some smaller stand-up rooms in the lobby area where we can do some two-channel stuff mm -hmm. but i haven't figured that out yet yeah. um without it costing a small fortune so yeah. but it's good to have the space like we yeah. know where we're going yeah. And it's definitely that's a benefit to not only us setting it up and getting it ready, but also to the vendors. You know, if we have to change it every year. I mean, ideally, we want to find the prime location and just grow with it. You know, a place that we can continue to grow and expand. And as more brands say, hey, we want to be a part of this and more attendees. We've had so many great. I mean, even tonight, I mean, people are dropping the comments. Scott says I'm in for next year already. Claude was there. No doubt. If you weren't there, you need to be. Uh, I like the Kansas City Convention Center. Glad to hear it's there again. Villa Man, we got to get you there next year. Love to get your wife out, man. It was really cool to see a lot of husbands and wives come. So that was really neat this year. So that was different. Um, great choice for the venue. These dates are a lock. Absolutely. That's why we're throwing them out now so that you can go ahead and at least put in your vacation time. So those are already good to go. It'll be at the Kansas City Convention Center. We just wanted to hold off to see if there's another option, maybe with a hotel. 
I know Ryan's like, oh, the money isn't that big. Yes, the money is a big thing. That's a big risk. So my wife will sleep better probably at night knowing that we don't have a $200,000 <laughs> event that we got to figure out a way to pay for. So, yeah, perhaps expand. Uh, so I love this question, man. We get this quite a lot. All right. So CB Moore says, perhaps expand M-Wave to the coasts. So here's the thing right now. Honestly, it is way easier for you guys to jump on a flight or rent a vehicle and drive than it is for us to move it to another location. It's a huge challenge. Um, last year, we did it in six months. So we had six months to plan and prepare. Uh, this year, this past year, we had a year and we spent the whole year planning, um, promoting, working with vendors, um, just making some updates and some changes, the room correction, room, or not room correction, but all of the, the AB comparison rooms. So let me turn this thing off. Um, Brian, you should be in the chat. Stop blowing up my phone, man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> um but yeah, so right now, you know, we, we're not really looking at, I mean, we're doing good just to expand where we're at. So first year, about 83. Last year, uh, in 2023, we had just over 300. It's very well possible that we could, um, you know, hit, eat, you know, maybe close to 1,000, like um, three and four Carpenter says. So could very well triple um, just based on feedback we've got. Of course, we were able to do a lot of content this year, which I think will help a lot. Because at least you guys get a chance to see what M-Wave is about. And you're like, oh, dude, I totally want to be a part of that. Claude, you're totally right. Drink was an issue and food. So we're going to work on that as well this year. Um, maybe have some food trucks outside. They were supposed to have that one little section. They were. But I don't yeah, know what happened happen. there. So that was on them. But um, yeah, see, so KC isn't that far from you. Absolutely, dude. Yeah. Awesome, man. I don't think food and drink should be an issue if the weather was not kind of crazy with that storm that came through and stuff, because there are some places to eat, not very far. I think away. they're just saying like well, right there. Yeah. Like, like if, if I wanted a bottle of water, if I wanted it. to just get a quick lunch and then go back inside instead of trying to find a restaurant, yeah. it was or kind like of problematic. Of or yeah. Sandwich, things like that would just be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Just be able to kind of grab and go, go get a soda. Cause mm -hmm. I didn't even know where you could go and get a soda. I think you mm -hmm. could like further down. Yeah, a but, couple block, yeah. couple blocks away, two or three blocks away is where the stuff starts. Yeah, there's not anything. So right I think there. what we're gonna do next year is I'm gonna have like a different food truck every day. So it just yeah. provides. Will they be able to park there, lunches. Ryan? Yeah, they can. They can park right out front for the time being. The city allows them. There were a couple parked actually out there for the other event. You just really couldn't see them. And then we're gonna we'll publicize it that they're there. Because yeah. it doesn't cost us anything as long as we say, hey, well, you're going to get your money yeah, and we'll people are going to come out for X time. They're not going to have a problem with that. <laughs> you Americans calling it soda. Normally, I don't call it soda. Usually it's It Coke. is soda. I know, but normally it's What Coke. do you call it, you non-American? <laughs> I don't know they what probably, you are. You, Bruce, do you call it pop? I know some places they call it pop it's or soda. soda pop or soda. What are you guys in the chat? What do you Or call everything it? is Coke. Pop. Yeah, see, Tyler said it's pop. Bruce says it's pop. You guys I've are never weird. called it soda. It I've is never soda. Pop. What but do you I call it, Jonathan? I normally it's don't soda to me. Soda. Yeah. I want to. I usually say I want a Coke because that's all I drink. Canada calls it pop. Well, Canada's wrong. And everything is Coke, Coke, soda. Da? What is da? Vincent. Da? Yeah, Vincent says da, unless that's like duh. Oh. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Scott calls it beer. I love it. Too funny, man. Yeah, Brian calls it pop. My grandfather used to call it pop. And he was down here from the south. Same Coke or Pepsi. Pepsi's nasty. You're nasty. No, dude. Pepsi's... I like sweet stuff, but Pepsi just tastes funky. I like that bitterness and that kind of burn in your throat from the Coke. My kidney stones don't like it, though. Bitterness? It's like a burnt, not bitter, but it's like a burning. Sensation. I have never heard somebody describe bitter, like a Coca Cola bitter. as bitter. Not bitter. I meant to say like the burning sensation because oh. it makes you want to burp. Like it's just like a little burn. So here, this will be interesting for you. Yep. In the speaking of blind comparisons, our math teacher in freshman year did a little statistics test or like lesson, if you will. Yep. Let us try all these taste tests, these different sodas that were like the same oh, and Coke okay. and Pepsi. 
Uh-oh. And people had their preferences, like you're saying, and they couldn't tell when it was a blind test. I, so I can almost guarantee. I can almost guarantee it. <laughs> Let's do I, it at I, the speaker I, comparison. <laughs> Lazy <laughs> Susan, the soda. <laughs> Everybody drink out the same straw, man. Mm, yeah, we got to make sure at least one person has COVID. Oh boy, I already got that from the first M wave. No thanks. Mm. So, Opticomer Corner. Sorry about that. Opticomer. I can't pronounce that. Opticorner. I'll get it right. I live in Northeast Florida. Sweet, man. I'm down here in Central Florida. Uh, and it's hard to find a company like Audio Advice or Dream Media. I have, a, I have the room. I have the green light from the wife. I just can't identify a home theater company. So, if you're just looking for, like, who can help you kind of walk through the decisions of what you need for your room... Reach out to Ryan. He's a local, uh, not local, but a <laughs> authorized dealer for um, a lot no, of you can guys. reach out to me. Yeah, just hit him up. Shoot him an email. I'm trying to find it here. Where's it at? Yeah, or I don't know. Jump on the website, MidwestAVExperience.com/sales. That'll get in touch with him, and uh, he'll hook you up. We'll get you taken care of. Yeah, he'll jump I on do the travel. phone with you. Yeah. No problem doing that. And I just want to make sure that everybody has as good of an experience as they can. It's why yeah. I became a dealer. Yeah. Tarhoya, uh, bringing back mono. What does that mean? Anyway, Speaker explain. comparisons. They were just yeah. mono. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah we'll do that again. Yeah. yeah, we definitely, Speaking. there's some things we definitely want to make sure that we do this year. Speaking of which, we're probably going to put those behind a paywall. It's not going to be significant. It may just be $5. But the reason we have to do that or we want to do that is because I really can't be stuck in that room all weekend again, and I need time to be able to get out. And so we have to do signups or something so that people can go to these because I may only run them twice, right? So if I don't put a sign up and we open it to everybody, there's not enough space to make these comparisons work correctly because you can only do it for a limited number of people. So we're going to have to probably put it behind some limited paywall in order to f- ensure that the people that sign up are going to come, right? Because if we just do signups, everybody's going to sign up for them. And then if people don't show up, well, now they've just taken a seat from somebody that may want to be there. So that's why we, that's going to happen. But the, we've got to do that because I can't be stuck. In that. I, I enjoy it, but so there's think- a lot of things that I need to. Are you thinking about maybe to- like doing one comparison two or three times on one day and then maybe the next day switch it to something else. Two or I three don't times. know yet. I'm not entirely sure what we're going to do. It depends on the number of comparisons that we're going to run, sure. like the different types. Uh, it's possible. I may mm-hmm. run them one or two times, but even then we start eating up a significant amount of time. So my bet is we're going to run them once, Okay. but it's something that we're going to do every year because if yeah. we limit the num- the amount of exposure if you didn't see it one year you can come and see it again the next year it's yeah. it's just kind of a necessary a evil unfortunately no that's a long time to wait it is but it, it's tough it's <laughs> unless there's somebody that really wants to do it all all weekend i just can't do that cuz i then i have to leave and then there's nobody running the comparison and it just doesn't yeah. it doesn't work very well so yeah, so definitely, you know, this is some things that we're, um, you know, just kind of working through because, again, nobody's doing the things that we're trying to do at M-Wave. And so there's definitely some challenges. There's definitely some decisions. And each year we just want to make it better and better for you guys so that when you come, you have an amazing experience. You come away with some resources. You come away with just some practical knowledge um, that you didn't have before you came to the event. Uh, so number one, I ask. 24, 24 acoustic room treatments need way more attention as your room acoustics dominate what you're actually hearing vendors before shootouts, but I'll take either. So are you saying like we need to treat the rooms? Is that what he's saying for even the vendors? The hard part is number one, we have massive rooms. Even if we had just little hotel rooms, if you go to any convention, you go to Axpona, you go to Florida audio expo, you go to audio vice live, none of those rooms have acoustic treatment. None of them. Unless the vendors bring them because they're you just physically can't provide that. I mean, this year we provided some of the things like the um, trusses. So we bought those. 
Uh, we provided pipe and drapes. That's expensive. So things like that, it just it just becomes really, really expensive. And so if we were to do acoustic treatment, I mean, imagine a, a room that is 1400 I think he's square. saying asking if acoustic vendors could be present, which is possible. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, we invited them. So it's just up to them if they want to come. Yeah. And, but what does he mean by vendors before shootouts? But I'll take either's? I don't know. I guess he, Chris, he wants if you can clarify, vendors. that would be helpful. Maybe he's saying he'd rather have more vendors than more shootouts. I don't know. I think is what he's saying. Okay. Claude says maybe we could use a volunteer to help run them. That's possible, but that's a big ask. And mm -hmm. I don't really like having people, you know, cancel effectively their entire experience of M Wave to be stuck yeah. in this room. That's not really, really fair. So mm -hmm. that's why I do it, but I need to be able to get out to help people with problems. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, vendors have problems they do yeah they have they have needs and can't figure this out or they need that uh okay yeah yeah that's what it was he was just wanting to say you know ask more acoustic vendors oh to be yeah there. we may so we there's some that. possibilities there i love this one mm -hmm, with yeah. and without acoustics comparison how good would that be that'd be it great. would but I how do you transition do fast enough we would have to do that in that little room You'd have to have two identical setups. Maybe it'd, it'd be a little simple 5.1 or something. Mm -hmm. One would be treated, one wouldn't, and you'd shuffle them between maybe because those rooms are big enough to do that. Maybe. Maybe. Or you just have them leaning up against the wall and you take them in and out of the room. Maybe. We That's could do all. it. You could do it on two rooms, but we have so few limits. Like mm -hmm. we have so few rooms eating up two rooms to do that. And the other problem is those rooms are not going to make the most of that demonstration because mm -hmm. you have they're so big and there the already smaller is rooms some treatments would. on the wall. The smaller rooms would that Perlison was in with their two channel mm -hmm. demo. They would, but it, when I think of that, so I'm thinking back to like my first home theater where it was tile floor and drywall walls and drywall ceiling and no treatments. Mm -hmm. Something like that with acoustic treatments in and out would be your night and day difference that sure. people would really see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's one of the things it's hard to do. Not to say mm. that we can't. Maybe we, that's one for a future one where you guys have more hotel style. style. Mm. Maybe. Yeah, we, we definitely heard some not so ideal hotel rooms, spaces. <laughs> I mean, literally, you walk sure, in, sure. Oh, wow, we, we definitely, we got to do something in this room because it's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. but that would be a good before and after. Scott, I appreciate the offer from Kat, man. That would be super helpful. Jessica's going to come next year. Uh, as well, my wife and even maybe my daughter. So that would be super helpful because I know I got, I kind of got stuck up there for about five hours one day. And because uh, again, you, you don't want to tax your volunteers, but the volunteers were amazing. They helped out for a couple hours each day. Um, but I found out that it, it was weird. We had people coming and registering literally the whole time. So there wasn't, you know, even though I said, okay, registration is this hour or this two hours. That doesn't work. You know, everybody's got their own schedule and when they can get there. So, but yeah, that'd be super helpful. So if you don't mind, um, jump on the website sometime and fill out that volunteer. That way I can put her on the list. That'd be super helpful. All right, cool, man. You want to jump into some questions? So again, if you got questions, drop those in the chat. We'll just do in the order that they, uh, they come. Before you go to the general purpose questions, there's yeah. one more here about the, the, yeah, do it. There you go. Okay, cool. So Tiki says, doesn't the convention center have movable room dividers to make the rooms smaller? Certain rooms no. do, but even then, it takes a massive room and makes it a little bit less massive. So the classrooms that we were in this year do not have that. There are three <laughs> other, there's a big room that we didn't use that we will use next year that does. Mm -hmm but they're going to be a 3,000 square foot room and I think two 2,000 square foot rooms. So yeah. there's so, there's always yeah. limitations mm -hmm. when it comes to this. Yeah. Cool, man. Mike, appreciate it. He said he's going to attend next year, plan on offering help, set up, break down, as long as I don't have prior commitments. So we'd love your help, man. That's one thing about M-Wave. The community that comes alongside of us to help us make this thing work is amazing. Um, this year, actually go ahead and mention this too, Ryan, mm. uh, this past year, Ryan was like, you know, we're going to make it easy on our vendors. We'll have some of them ship all their stuff to my house and my mom's house, <laughs> including the <sighs> meal 
and tons of speakers and tons of subwoofers to and, my mom's house. Theater, and theater <laughs> seats. And let's rent three trucks to get it back and forth from my house to the venue. Oh boy. So that was crazy. We finished up like 2 a.m. on the last day. So we finished packing the trucks at the show yeah. at like 8 p.m. Yeah. We didn't finish unloading them. Yeah. Just into the garages. Yeah. Until 2 a.m. Yeah. It was it was a long night. So this year. I'm not doing that again. 2020 or technically next year, 2024. Um, it's called Dredge. What's the name of the Dredge? Dredge. So contracting with some companies to help us store that. So brands can ship it to them. They'll be responsible to bring it over to the venue. The brands can pick it up, take it into their rooms. And then at the end of the show, they put it in the room. They come and pick it back up. So, um, so that'll be, I think, a lot easier. So, But we definitely will still need quite a few volunteers. So we're grateful for all of you guys. Uh, da, 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 da. Cool, man. Lots of folks. And see, that's what I love about this community, man. You guys are super helpful, always willing to help out. Um, and it's fun, man. I mean, we try to make it fun. Have a good time with it. Thought about a semi? We did. Um, but again, it. I mean, it's it's not the space. We had three moving trucks, big moving trucks. These are what, 26 foot? Three 26 so foot trucks. Yeah, it wasn't really the space. It's just the physical manpower to get everything loaded up and then unloaded, getting it into, um, you know, the venue, out of the venue. So it just, it's a lot of work for sure. All right. Let's jump into some comments here, man. All right. Adam Killer says, I have an AV receiver with pre outs. Is there any way that I can take two channels, convert them to RCA, and add an external amp? to power two speakers. Your AV receiver probably already has RCA outs. Yeah. That's what I'm looking at. He says he says it does have pre outs. There's two types, XLR or RCA are your typical kinds. And if you have a pre a pre pro, it's usually XLR, but you say AV receiver, those usually have RCA. The answer is yes, almost certainly, because that's what pre outs are there for. Yeah. I'm I don't know your question, Adam. Yeah, so if you have RCA pre-outs, you would come out of that left and right, go into your two-channel amplifier, and then power those two speakers. And with the AVR, they're always hot, so you don't have to worry about turning them on or off inside the AVR. <laughs> Scott's correcting us. It says He's without pre-outs. Oh, I see. So no, you don't want to do oh. that. Oh, yeah. How no. do we all miss that? All three of us missed that. Oh, <laughs> I didn't read it that way. I read it as, I read it as with pre-outs. So without's one word though. So cut me a little break there. Yeah. I've never, I've, I've used some of those little converters like that line, line out converters yeah. to RCA and they're never very clean. Maybe no. there's a high quality one somewhere, but the ones in car audio are junk. Yeah. I don't recommend that. Look, all these people in the chats telling us we we read that wrong. We did. Yeah, I know it. You got us. We did. Newbie I'm always that. wrong, so that should Newbie come as no surprise. Burgers had terrible distortion. He tried that. Yeah, they're not yes. ideal, Adam. If you can buy even a, a used AVR that has pre-outs, um, and that's one thing I always recommend. When you're building your home theater, I know it's more expensive to buy one with pre-outs, and it's easy to kind of cut that corner to save money because – you don't foresee yourself needing an amplifier, but inevitably most of us along this journey at some point in time, we at least want to try out an amplifier. And so if you don't have pre outs, you really limit yourself on that. So um, definitely recommend doing that. And he also says, what are your thoughts on THX? Is it required for THX speakers or is it snake oil? Snack oil. <laughs> snack, I like that one. Snack oil. Snack oil. So, yeah, snake oil. Yeah. <laughs> so THX is a certification. Um, like, and I know some comments earlier talking about Perlisten. So Perlisten, um, they were the first company to hit THX Dominus. And so with THX, each different standard, whether it's THX Select, THX Ultra, THX Dominus, you have different standards and kind of criteria that those speakers or subwoofers have to meet. Just because something doesn't have THX stamp of approval on there or that license or certification doesn't mean it's a less product because these companies have to pay for that license. 
they have to pay for that certification. So they put it through the test, they pay for that, that stamp of approval. Um, and so not all companies are willing to put that money in because some see the value, some don't. It was really smart for Perlisten to do that because nobody knew who they were. They were a brand new company, even though the uh, one of the founders was a very well-known engineer, designed speakers and subwoofers for other companies for many years. He's building his own speaker brand that nobody knows who they are. And so for them to come out of the gate with, I think, 21 um, THX Dominus certified speakers and subwoofers, that was a huge statement. I mean, like big time. And it just added credibility to them. But I don't think you it I don't think you necessarily have to have that certification. Um, but is it required for THX speakers? Yes. I mean, if for some something to be considered a THX speaker, it needs to be THX certified, if that answers your question, if I read that correctly. But all THX is a cer is a certification and Correct. most of us actually really almost the entire industry doesn't know what THX means. Yeah. Because yeah, if they, you go ask really them, it, like if yeah. you literally go ask for listen, they'll say, yeah. they'll give you some stuff, but then they can't yeah. tell you. We can't tell you. We'd have which, to, we'd have to kill which you. makes sense because if they tell you what the certification means, then everybody's just going to say that they, if they have meet that certification, that they're the same thing. So it kind of defeats yeah. the and, and they didn't pay the money to do it. Yeah. So, got it. Let me jump down here. Tango, appreciate the super chat. Um, I'm not sure what DKK is. Somebody let me know. Um, so I'm just going to say $100 super chat. So your hi-fi community is awesome. It will grow and grow. Just wait and see what the future brings to you guys. And by the way, you guys are awesome too. Man, I appreciate it, man. Love the community. Love the feedback. I love hanging out with you guys and helping you and inspiring you on your home theater journey. Definitely appreciate the love and support, brother. JD, the expert says, youth man, what do you think of Hisense TV? So I actually have a Hisense TV. Um, it's actually the only TV that I've owned in 17 years that we've been here. So other than my, my kids, they have them in their bedrooms. They're just nothing fancy. This one's super budget friendly. We like it. Works great. It's an 83 inch U7H. Definitely not the deepest black levels. Definitely not probably the brightest TV in the world but it completely meets our needs. It's a little slow sometimes in the UI. Um, you know, you'll tell it to do something. It's kind of like my Harmony Elite. It's like, what do you want me to do? Oh, you want me to move? And then it'll go. So it's not like as responsive as say an iPhone or something. Mikey says, Hisense TVs are great. The U7 and U8 are amazing for the price. And I think you're right, Mikey. That's what I shared in my review is that I think this thing provides a huge um, value to consumers especially if you're trying to get a large immersive experience in your living room um, to try to get something equivalent in like an OLED, you're going to get a little bit smaller TV, what maybe a 77 inch and you're going to spend four to $5,000 versus about 1500 for that high sense U7H. Um, and they have different tiers too. They have some higher end ones that have better specs and 120 refresh rate and um, higher lumens or output or whatever you want to call it. So maybe not lumens. What do they measure TVs in? Nits. 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 Okay. So higher nits. So speaking of nits, I bought <laughs> I bought this little thing, man. So I measured my NX7 before I sold it and uh, had help. Had you guys help me. I'm like, hey, man, how do I use this thing? What do I do? What settings do I need to change? And so I got that measured, locked in, put it in my phone. So when I get the NZ8, I'm just curious, like, what is the knit difference there? Um, so I'll be measuring that. So, and then I can have it for future stuff too. Like when I do a ultra short throw comparison, so I could find out like how many uh, knits it's hey, hold on. What's up, buddy? My sound has decided it doesn't want to be nice. Uh, I can hear you. Those things are interesting. Those little light meters, Michael, while he's fixing that, they're interesting even to detect to test your black levels and stuff too, right? Because really, if, if you're comparing two projectors, exactly. you can put it on the blacker portion of the screen and you can get a reading if it, how gray it is effectively uh, versus how bright. So it's got it's got the other functionality as well. Interesting. I didn't know that. Very cool. I did not know that. 
Hey, Tango, no worries, man. No, it's going to, I think it automatically puts it in your currency. I just, I'm not familiar with what DKK is. Um, can't seem to get it into dollars. Sorry for the, not an inconvenience at all. Not at all. It's more of, I just don't know how to properly say a hundred DKK. I'm, I'm just not sure what that currency is. But I appreciate the love and support. Zachary, appreciate the $20 super chat. Michael, watch the tour yeah. video that you just purchased, or I'm not purchased, <laughs> posted today. I didn't hear you mention the seating during the video. Any idea what those rocker seats on the front and back rows are? Any other recommendations for good rocker seating? Great question. Um, I did add all of the information uh, that I had from the Audio Advice Live, or not Audio Advice Live, Audio Advice did a tour probably several months ago before uh, the homeowner had added a lot of the, the height speakers and the updated to the trend knob. So I included all the information that they had in that video. Um, I don't know. I'm going to look here real quick. Let me just take a look in the description to see if it mentions what seating he has. So we got speakers, video, acoustics, um, equipment rack, kaleidoscape, theater seating. They're called Cinematech Legrand Theater Seating for the center row. Oh, it just says client sourced their own theater seats for the front and back row to match. So I'm not sure. He didn't really provide that information. So I'm not sure where he got those. So he just basically found them and bought them. So good question. But yeah, he went with like fancy seats in the middle. And that was his money seats. And then just kind of like your normal theater seating at, that you'd find at your local cinema. So with just the fold down chairs. Charlie B, appreciate the $5 super chat. Would a Marantz AV10 be much of an upgrade over the Anthem AVM70? If so, at Ryan, um, do you still have an open box unit from the show? No open box. And do I think it would be an upgrade? No. I think it's a side grade. I think you're just changing, a lateral move. You're just changing one good pre pro for another. Now, if you're not happy with arc, maybe, or if you want more channels because the AV 10 is a 15.4. Sure. I think the AVM seventies, how many channels does the AVM 70 support? 16. Um, I thought it was a 15 maybe. with, and two, two subs, I think. What is that right? 15.2. Yeah. So still quite a lot mm -hmm. in that. But if you need the extra two channels, AVN to AV 10 is great. And you get direct. But mm -hmm. overall, like hardware wise, you're there's not a difference. You're not going to notice anything. Unless you really want the Marantz's distortion chip. Marantz distortion chip? Yeah. What is that? They intentionally ha they have a chip that intentionally colors the oh, okay, audio okay. using distortion. I was like, Ooh. turn it on and off in the new yeah. ones. Yep, it's very subtle. We told about <laughs> we've <laughs> we talked, talked about, about it that previous. Yeah. yeah, I just didn't know. I never heard of it. Was being switched. Chip. I was like, what is that? Weston Little says, if I'm on a budget, could I use SVS powered speakers as rears? When I transition to 5.1, secondly, is Golden Ear Force Field 40 an OK sub for home theater? I'm on a budget, and I already have one. So I guess he already has one sub, and he's looking at getting another one. So I'm going to pull up that sub because I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, Golden Ear Force Field 40. Can you 40. put that on screen? Uh-huh. 40 Force Field. Let's take a look here. All right. Looks like Crutchfield's got one. Let's throw it up there. Present. Yeah, because I'm not familiar with that particular sub. All right, let's take a look. So it's 10 inch. So it's not going to have a ton of. Um, Weston, follow up question. How big is your room? 1200 bucks. Man, it's been so long since I've owned a 10 inch. It'd be hard for me to go back to one. All right, so we got a thousand one amp. Digs down to 14 hertz. That's good. Uh, Golden Ear is famous for. Are they fudging the numbers? Exaggerating their specs a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I hate that. I'm not familiar with them. I don't think I've ever. I may have had. Actually, I, I take that back. I did one home theater tour that he had a Golden Ear sub. Um, just looking at any other information here. 
Yeah. Ten, my, my thought is though, the 10 inches where you're going to, you're just not going to get a ton of output out of a 10 inch, even a Mac daddy 10. I mean, that's just physics. Um, once I upgraded from a 10 to a 15, it was like night and day for my room. And it wasn't a, I bought it used. It was a Velodyne sub. And I was like, Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Then when I went from 15 to dual 15s and then now 18s, it's really hard to go back to a smaller driver unless you got a small room. I weren't think that's you, why Ryan. Weren't you testing 10s, Jonathan, or were those 8s? No, I have a 10 that I blew up trying to do even yeah. a fraction of my 18. So and it I'm was like, trying to keep up near field. Yeah. 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 I've shown this in multiple podcasts. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I almost guarantee that this is a beefier driver than what's in that golden ear. Mm -hmm. And I blew it up. Yeah. This is a beefy driver. And I, and I was, I had it near field just trying to get a fraction of what my 18s give me near field to see if I could not have these huge boxes behind my seats. Big yeah. boxes. It didn't last very long. Didn't and work. I was disappointed in what I was able to do. Oh, mercy. Yeah. So, I mean, I just, I think that's going to be a limiting factor. Um, I don't think golden ear is known for, you know, making amazing subwoofers and you're going to be limited. And I'm um, just going to say, man, $1,200 for a 10 inch, you can do a better value proposition. Wow. That's yeah. a lot of money for a, tw for a 10 inch. $1,200. I mean, you're getting into, you're starting to get into like 12 quality, 12 inch driver subs, even um, 15s, man, even some 15s. I mean, what's the shoe? They're yeah. like, what are the 1200 ish? Maybe yeah. is that right? Yeah. Or you that HSU 15 VTF three yeah is that would it is? wipe the floor with that I, tell you, I just got one in oh yeah you're yeah. gonna like that michael yeah. I'm, excited I'm excited about that i am too man yeah see randy says hue 15 is a better deal yeah and then you've uh, got that stark i've never heard them but the stark 15s that you can get two for a thousand or whatever it is yeah well you heard them ryan unless you haven't been over to keith's house since he mm -hmm. bought them keith bought yeah. them Did they, they sound do a good fun. job they sound they sound great in his room he's good. got a smaller room but they sound great yeah, Weston, looks like there's some guys dropping some some suggestions for you. Maybe at least give those a consideration. If you have the space, there's a shoe 15. Um, there's a spa 18. That's a new company on the market. He's talking about PSA. You type spa at first. Can you put that, the second link I put in private chat, Michael, mm -hmm. can you put yeah. that in the public chat? So second that, link, copy. Yeah, the HSU one. It's on sale for $1,200 right now. So I... This is yeah. the shoe. What is it? That should be the one that you're getting ready to review. BTF 15, I think. All right. Yeah. I mean, I like, that like Ryan said, that's going to mop the floor with that, uh, that, yeah. that, with that 10. Yeah. yeah. Take a look at Dr. that. Dr. Shoe does some get, awesome stuff. You can almost get dual P. Yeah. So lots of folks dropping some information, but at least check those out. And sometimes we just don't know because we don't know. You know, um, you may not have ever heard anything other than Golden Ear. So, but. But it always, it, I mean, we're all on a budget. I mean, the reality. And we all have to work within a price constraint unless you just got oodles of money or you're printing money like Ryan does. No. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't. I just like to say that. I like his reaction. All right. Uh, Sassicant says, Jonathan, now that the original database site seems to be down for good, do you know if anyone has created an archive on its benchmarks and comparison tools. I have not seen that yet. You can use the Wayback Machine. It's an internet archive site <clears throat> to kind of piece it together, but you're going to have a hard time finding it all in one place. I see Ryan getting some ideas. Did you well, so I just wanted to back up on that, the 10 inch versus 15 to provide another caveat, little He's thing slow. of data. <laughs> I was looking it up. A 10 inch driver has an area of just over 78 inches. Okay. A 15 inch driver has an area of 176 inches. Yikes. Yeah. It just it won't work. I mean, you're over double the amount of surface area. Plus, I can almost guarantee that that shoe 15 is going to have more excursion than the 10. Yeah. It just, the 10's just going to get eaten alive. And once you experience bigger drivers like that, yep. get your mind out of the gutter, everybody. You're just not going it. to be able to go yeah. go back to it. You can yeah. typically do a generic two to one for each size increase, mm -hmm. generically. So right. 
generic two tens for one twelve, two twelves for one fifteen, two fifteens for one eighteen, that type of scenario, two eighteens mm-hmm. for one twenty one. Uh seventy four. <laughs> That was a huge jump. Nuts. That's nuts. So it, it, with that generic math, it's not it's not perfectly for every single situation, but generic math, you're looking at four of those 10 inch for 115 type range. I mean, right. yeah. Some wiggle room, but that realm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, rhythmic, HSU, lots of different options for you, but oh mercy. See, Chris is already heading down the <laughs> not Chris. Who was it? Somebody's making fun of my Nick, math right there. Carry the I'll two. Look, I'll look at that <laughs> Nicholas. Yeah. All right. Bernard says dual PB four thousands or dual SB sixteens. Use cases mostly movies and gaming. I know what my vote would be. I'd do the PB four thousands. Sort of depends on how big your room is and so forth. We've kind of talked about ported versus sealed mm-hmm. and what use case uses what. My room, is, and here's the thing, my room isn't massively big. I reviewed the SB-16s. I had two of them. I just wanted more. Not that they were slouches by any means, but I just, man, I wanted more. So I had them send me the PB-16s and ended up buying them. I sold my clips, bought the PB-16s. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. My vote would probably be the PB-4000s. But that's just me. So... Uh, da, 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 da. you'll get more output from that. Jose says, what do you guys think about using a phantom center instead of a physical center channel? So I've, no. I get this question quite a bit. So some guys love phantoms and they swear up and down by them. I don't prefer them. I would rather have a dedicated center channel. Have you all ever heard anybody's system with a, a phantom center? Mm-hmm. I mean, I know they do it in two channel a lot, but like in actual movies. Like yes. That. Yeah. What What do you think of it? I have the same opinion you do. It's it's kind of like a an aid or a crutch if you can't do a proper center channel, but a center channel is going to rule the day, in my in my opinion. I think so. Yeah, and then the reason why way. go into the reason why, Michael. It's it's off axis seating. If you're in that center seat, it it's passable. But if you're anywhere else, you get drawn to the the sound from the nearest speaker. So yeah. if you're sitting in the left seat or the right seat, all you really hear is the left speaker or the right speaker. You don't have a center image, and so you're your dialogue isn't centered on the actor's face on the middle of the screen for your movie. It's Mm -hmm. maybe if you just care of a one seat theater, you don't care about any other seats. It might be okay, but yeah. Yeah. So even Ryan says the same thing. You're only one person, maybe, but outside that, nah, Jason likes a real center. I agree with you guys. And I still feel you guys tell me what you think about this. I'm interested. Uh I'm listening to those Arendelles right now and they image really well. Like I really like them. But there's something there's something different about every single center imaging that I've ever heard compared to an actual physical speaker in that center position. I don't know if I can put a finger on it exactly what it is, but it doesn't sound exactly like a physical speaker to me. Um, vocal sounds like it's centered. It sounds like there's a speaker there, but it's not quite the exact same sound to my ears. Mm-hmm. I've always felt that way. What mm-hmm. do you guys think? Is when it you're trying to do it, I couldn't hear you both. Say it, one of you say it. Go ahead, Michael. When you're doing a talking about doing a phantom center, yeah, not even for movies, just two channel listening, just two channel. I don't know. There are times that I mean, I can get a, a great. So here's the interesting thing: when I'm listening to music, it's always weird if I use if if the vocals are coming from the center channel. I don't know why. I don't like that. Mm-hmm. I actually like it coming from the two speakers, mm-hmm. even though with imaging and if you get them dialed in and towed in just right and they've got good dispersion and all that, then then you can actually, like your brain can tell you, man, my center channel's on. Yeah. At times I've gotten up and walked up to a center channel and went, oh man, that thing tripped yeah. me. I thought it was yeah. on. And that's a cool experience. Um, but but if yeah. you had to put a percentage on it there, do you feel like you can get 100% there as a real physical or can you get 80% there or 90% there? What's your, where do you fall out on like how, how tricky it is? Like how yeah. legit? I don't know what a number would be, but yeah, I mean, I'm with Nicholas. I mean, that's the most, one of the most important speakers in a home theater. So trying to mimic it and kind of do a faux center channel. I just don't think it works as good. Ryan, I know you're a big two channel guy. This, mm-hmm. The movie isn't mixed that way. Mm-hmm. I think you're, you're mex- messing with how the mix is actually portrayed, mm-hmm. which I think is part of why, you're perceiving in a different way. Maybe if it was mixed in stereo, 
Mm -hmm. but it wasn't mixed that way. So now your AVR or pre is doing a down conversion into whatever you're trying to do. Um, I'm a big two channel guy, but I still would not watch a movie without a center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What it about doesn't sound the same? I, I I agree. I think we're all on the same page there. But in regards to two channel listening, with your giant Martin Logans that are there pictured in the in the shot there, do you feel like there's a third Martin Logan like identical? You can't hear a difference, or do you feel like there's a little difference in two difference? channel music? Yes. Okay, so you you're can, it, you're full on. It's physical there. It might as it, well be. It physical. fools people all the time. They swear my center channel is on. Right. That's just that's one of the music. That's yeah. one of the things the Martin Logan's excel at is their imaging is phenomenal. Like mm -hmm. you swear there is something coming out of the middle because she is whoever the vocalist, yeah. the whatever is smack dab in the middle and anchored there. Mm -hmm. But when you go into a mix and this is my opinion, when you go into a mix, that's not mixed for two channel. I just don't think it works. Mm -hmm. You're relying on the AVR or pre to do the down mix. And I just don't think it's, appropriate maybe if it was mixed in stereo yeah but it's not and you're relying on speakers that are outside and i think it messes with the anchoring yeah my personal opinion i'm with you so yeah i have speakers that do this very well i still wouldn't do it cb moore says per listen i've heard they're great for home theater what about two channel stereo Nah, they suck <laughs> <laughs> fantastic they're very I'm good of, i'm of the opinion if you have a quality built speaker actually just recently one of my videos was titled that it was like can speakers be good for two channel and you know movies and i think the answer is yes i don't think they have to be one or the other even though some people kind of preach that i think a quality built well-designed speaker will sound good listening to music it'll sound great listening to a home theater um so but yeah i think they're fantastic they're great they're well built well designed um, I've heard them in two channel setups. I've heard them in dedicated home theaters. We had them at M wave phenomenal. They had both of them set up at M wave. They had the two channel set up. Now the room wasn't ideal in that one uh, acoustically and oh, okay. Appreciate it. Mike DKK is Danish crones. Appreciate the updates. Dude, I love you guys are all over the world, man. That's awesome. Uh, Drexel Den says, Hey guys, I'm building my first home cinema. Congratulations. Has the NZ eight. Marantz, well, let's go back to the prelistens here real quick. Oh my God. <laughs> well, you just kind of stopped talking and then moved on. So the prelistens, I th I do agree with Michael that all the speakers are going, to, if it excels at one, it's probably going to excel at the other. However, with something like prelisten, the one thing you need to remember is that they are a directive speaker. They're not going to portray themselves like a horn's going to or a coaxial or any of that stuff. They are a limited dispersion. They're going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of like 50 to 40 in the horizontal and very narrow off the top, getting mm -hmm. bordering on zero. So if you're in that window, they're fantastic. And one of the benefits that they provide with the limited dispersion is it limits the amount of room reflections because you don't have the sound coming out as wide. It's much more narrow. So that can be a benefit, but it can also be a curse because if you're sitting outside of that, like what we saw at M-Wave with a speaker like the B100, it changes your perception of how the speaker is playing the audio. So mm -hmm. just something to consider um, that they're great and they're one of the only other speakers that I've had in my house and I really, really like them. Um, just know that they are different than what a traditional spe speaker is going to portray itself as. Yeah, and I think that's... Uh, we've always tried to be an advocate of try to get an opportunity to hear as many yes. speaker setups as you possibly can because you're going to figure out what your ears prefer, what sound you like, the style, the type of speaker, type of drivers and things like that, their dispersion pattern. Um, and ideally, you know, it would be in somebody's home that's well-treated, you know, a nice room. Mm -hmm. We've got definitely some demos at Mway. We'd love to have you join us. Um, we had Perlison, like I said, in a two channel setup. We had it in a, a home theater environment. We got lots of other vendors that, that are doing the same thing. And just to give you some practical experience with these brands, I'd love to have Arendelle next year. I think they're going to try to provide a, a home theater setup for us. So that would be super cool for you guys to experience that. Um, but that's, there's no, I mean, we can share with you what we like and what we prefer, but really, 
if you can, man, try to find somebody that's got that set up so that you can hear it with your own ears and make your own decisions. Can I go to the next question? Mother yes. man. Yeah. <laughs> Drexel's Den. Hey guys, I'm building my first home cinema, NZ8 Marantz uh, SR. Is it the 8015? I think. Yeah. I don't think there's an 8105 as Not a receiver. Yet. So 8015 is a beautiful beast. I love that AVR. Um, but unsure on a screen size. Room is 18 by 11. The walls, uh, eight foot. So he's about eight, a little bit over eight feet, almost nine foot ceiling. What screen size should I get? That's a, honestly, that's a great question. Um, I always recommend just go first and foremost, just to one of the online calculators, just to see what that throw distance will allow. So if you have an NZ8, it's going to have a certain throw distance. It needs to be back a certain distance to be able to, to hit a certain size. Mm -hmm. um, depends on where your seating is. I sit nine foot from 150 inch diagonal in 2.35 to one aspect ratio. I love it to some people that might be a little extreme, um, but I've yet to have somebody sit in my home theater and go, man, that's, that's really straining on my eyes. That's difficult for me to, to watch a movie. Um, but everybody's different. Some people would want to be further back from that, but at least it'll give you a good idea. Um, Audio advice has a calculator on their website. And theirs actually will show you whether or not um, that size and that throw distance is going to be within the HDR specs. That's going to give you good HDR. Uh, so that would be my recommendation first and check that. Um, since you have the NZ8, the other thing that I would encourage you to do, fire that bad boy up, try different sizes in your room. Try it at 120, try it at 150 or whatever move your seating forward and backwards and you figure out kind of where just shine it up on the wall for now, you know, before you even buy your screen. I actually, in my room, when I was doing that very same thing, I was going from 103 to something much bigger, but I didn't know if I was going to do 120, 130, 140. I ended up with 150 is about as wide as I can go. Um, it's almost wall to wall on my 13 foot wide screen. And, so my, so I'm basically good question, Jason. So I am about 16 feet, maybe just a little over 16. So I'm like, I'm barely got enough room, um, to hit 150 inch diagonal at my throw distance. So it's like 16 feet, six inches, I think something like that to the lens. Uh, how the movie was shot decides which row I want to sit in. Interesting. Yeah. I've never sat in the back ever. So he's talking oh, about the shaky cam effect, I bet. Oh. If you're sitting too close in the Jason Bourne movies, and it's 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 almost too much. But if maybe it's director's row. intent for you to vomit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they got buckets you could just bring into your theater room. So so I, I will also suggest, just like Michael said, put it on the wall, watch a couple movies. Don't just put it on the wall and say, this is yeah. great. Watch sure. movies. Recline in your seat. Put your feet up. Make sure the tops of your toes aren't entering the screen. Mm -hmm. Um, depending on your chair situation, if you've got a recliner, you might need 25 inches off the ground before you clear your feet. So mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta kind of like do it in practice, figure out what yeah. you like in practice. My advice in your situation, if you're just starting out is if you've already got the projector and you don't have the screen yet, mm -hmm. mount it where it's going to go and then project it on the wall and build around that so that you can try mm -hmm. and figure all of this out. You can then figure out what the screen size is that you want to utilize how high it needs to be, so on and so forth. So you can actually do it in practice instead of just using a best guesstimation well, in order to do it. So one caveat to that, I wouldn't recommend mounting it until you figure out exactly the size that you want to go. Yeah, but maybe he knows exactly where he has to mount it. A lot of maybe. people do in their theaters. Yeah. I mean, like it's mine, I could move mine forward and backwards in the room. I actually had to cut a hole in the wall and mount my outside the room to be able to yeah. get 150 inch. Yeah. My next uh, theater, unfortunately, projector's got to go in the outside the room. In the neighbor's house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> shoot, through, shoot through the window, man. Yeah. It's going to be like 600 inches diagonal. So um, I saw a question here or a thought. Yeah, man. Gertie, I appreciate it, man. Um, love how helpful y'all are for people just starting out. We really want to be a help to you guys. Um I don't care if you've been in the business for you know decades or this is the first time maybe you're building your home theater. We want to be a resource to you and 
share some things we've learned along the way. I know I'm not the expert, um, but I've been in a lot of home theaters. I've had the privilege of filming over 50 home theaters on my channel and they're all different. And so it definitely has provided me with um, just some experience in that aspect. But these guys in Kansas city, they've got a bunch of home theaters in their area. And we have Wisconsin. no idea what we're doing. <laughs> they're still practicing, man. They're just, Hey, we've got practicing physicians. Why can't we have practicing? Uh, you know, home we theaters? have, we have like the equivalent of malpractice insurance for home theater. <laughs> wow. Bruce just run us under the bus, man. Look at him. He's a Gertie. They might be helpful. They're going to make you spend a <laughs> lot of money. <laughs> I do tell people no, okay? I do tell people, like yeah. the guy that was asking about the AV10 to Anthem. Yeah. We talk people down off the ledge. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes yeah. we give them a nice shove, but yeah. you know, we do talk people down. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Jason says, uh, this is why I'm struggling with the NZ8 and the screen movement into the room. I'm 17 foot now, but will be from 14 to 15 foot. So either move the NZ8 back or go to the NZ9. What are your thoughts there? NZ9. <laughs> he just told you to spend money. Well, money. I mean, yeah. it's a bigger lens. It's yeah. brighter. If money's not a problem, NZ9. If it is, How much reconstruction can you do for 10 grand to get those type price differences, though? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do a lot of remodeling for 10 grand. 10 grand well, yeah. well, I mean, it's a better projector, but still. Right. 10 yes. Grand. 15 versus 25. Yeah. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I do I but I have an NZ9 and I wouldn't go back. Sure. I yeah. mean I've had I've had an NZ7 and NZ8 and an NZ9 in my room and you guys have seen them. Sure. I I would go. Yours back. is beautiful. There's no doubt. Man, I'm ready to get mine set up though. Yeah, yeah. you are. So, but, kind of kind of along the same line. I'm and I'm kind of jumping out of order just because some of these comments are along the same thought. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Chuck says, "What's a good mount for the NZ8?" Um that be chief that's my vote i really like chief mounts they're they're yeah. more expensive but they're they're pretty stinking robust they are so the but problem your nz9's kind of gone over the weight limit on the chief mounts at least Shh. the basic one right Shh. <laughs> it's so the problem with the chief mount is the one that they were using before mm -hmm. and i'd have to look up what the it's an rpa something okay it has a weight limit of like 50 pounds, I think mm -hmm. it is, or 55 pounds. And it worked for the NX series all the way up yeah. through the NX9. Right. But the NZ series is too heavy. So you're supposed to use this other mount. Expensive. Like $400 more, right? It's stupid expensive. It's like But the bucks. main problem with it is it's enormous. Right. It's like this tall. Like just the mount onto the projector. Not the... It's enormous. Yeah. So... I see it as I could hang from this thing. Yeah. Like I could just <clears throat> get on there and not worry about it. Why is my projector going to fall off when it's a fifth of my weight? It's not going to take do this that. moment to make a legal disclaimer. Ryan is not a structural engineer. No, <laughs> I am not. So if you do this, you're the, the one doing it. Head. I didn't make anybody do any of this. So Jason, but, says there's some chiefs that hold up the 250. They pounds. do. Yeah, that's the ones we're talking about. That's the They're one we're really talking about, but it's huge. Yeah. I, I, I'm fully with you, Ryan. Those things, those chief mounts, even the $300 ones, they're so heavy duty. I really feel like we could hang on it. I, yeah. I mean, I don't see it falling with 60 like pounds. Like the number of threads through. and stuff that go up into these things, and it's just, it. Yeah. no. No. So I did the same thing here. Uh, looks like, so CB Moore says that he mounted uh, his on a shelf, and that's what I did. Since mine's outside of the room, we basically had to kind of, cut part of the closet out mm -hmm. um, so we just cut literally a square hole in the back wall and then we built a platform it's suspended by four like really thick threaded um what do you call those threaded not pipes anyway You're talking about the ntp pipes like the ones that are fitting the chief mounts it, it, no it's just literally like a steel threaded rod i guess is what they call it and so i basically we um, put some two by fours, mounted them to the wall. And then these threaded rods, all thread. what is it? It's called all thread, all thread. Yeah. Is and the whole thing matched. threaded? Yes. Yeah. It's called thing. all thread. You use that a lot in like commercial applications to hold up, um, 
like cable trays or all different kinds of stuff because you don't have to worry about the length. You just cut it to whatever length you need. Correct. And, and what's nice too is you can, I mean, you just, you know, loosen them, tighten them. You can move the shelf up and down, but that joker, it'll support, yeah, all thread. So it's, it's a Mac Daddy deal, man. So look at all y'all fancy guys. It's where Michael gets sent when, he, when he's in trouble. <laughs> what's that? You have to go climb up into that cubby hole when you get in trouble. Yeah, for sure, man. No, man, that NZ8's going up in there. Bum, 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 bum. All right, Master Juan says, would it be feasible to have a virtual tour you pay to access for the next M-Wave? What is that? Oh, okay, so you're talking about like, um, I got you. So we are looking at possibly adding a, what I call a digital access pass to M-Wave. I just don't know what all that's going to look like. Um, part of that is we need to make sure that we have decent Wi-Fi. And honestly, there's not really great Wi-Fi there. So streaming is, is going to be challenging unless we like purchase some kind of... You would have to use the streaming backpacks. Yeah, something like that. There's no other way around it, which this year may be the year we do it. I don't know. Yeah. We talked about it for last year, yeah. and oh, it was just a little bucks. too much. Yeah. Um, so because have... it wasn't... The cost, again, wasn't the part that was worrisome. It was, does Michael have enough time? Is it advantageous to the vendors and so forth? And will it make sense for people to view it? Is it advantageous for you guys to pay for? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, we may do it this year, though. Yeah, let us know in the chat. I mean, would you want some type of access? And let us know even, like, what would you want to see? Because the hard part is, you know, if we do, you know, would that be live streaming the seminars? Would that be live streaming? It's hard to do a comparison because the comparison may be, I don't know, I guess it'd be an hour long. Um, but yeah, just trying to figure out how to mic the person up that's running it. And there's definitely some challenges on that. But let us know if that's something that you're interested in. So we're definitely considering it. Um, there's just some some details we'd have to work out. But yeah, man, appreciate the suggestion. So Bernard says, dual, uh, we did that one. You guys don't trust us, man. I think that's why you... you ask a couple times i wouldn't trust uh, mr. us either what's that <laughs> i wouldn't trust us either mr salamander would the jtr noesis 110 ht be a good choice for speakers in a 2.1 setup with a 106 inch projection screen i live in a condo so placing speakers everywhere and behind the screen is not possible your poor neighbor i'm assuming you're talking about putting those outside of your screen 106 well, hold on we gotta he said he lives in a condo we gotta address that first right i mean those things if There's you're in a condo, app. are you ever going to leave a condo? Because the Noesis, I mean, that's a lot of speaker <laughs> unless you really hate your neighbors. But you got a volume, man. But my point is, is if you're never yeah. leaving you're not- a condo, then yeah. that's too much. Michael's the one to ask on this. He's got those in his room right now. Yeah, I'd be all right with cranking it, man. Because every once in a while you can crank it. You don't have to make your neighbors mad all the time, but every just once in a while. Just your, invite them over, dude. That's the thing. You invite your neighbors. Like, hey, man, I, I want to crank this thing. You want to come over and join me? Yeah, dude, let's rock it out. That's how you get around mm. that. Or you just make them more angry. Yeah. Can you use the 110 HTs as 2.1? Sure. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Not as the point one. Well, just yeah. Would, no. Yeah. But he would need, but he's wanting to know, can he use those as his mains? So um, been good. Uh, home Theater Nerd. Uh, in the last show, Ryan mentioned having HDMI 2.1 cable issues. Can you please elaborate on the issues that you encountered mm. while you do that? Where does he start? I'll be right back. Guys. Which issue? How do I... there... You've never had an HDMI 2.1 issue, Ryan? I have. There's, pl- there's many issues. I'm just, <laughs> I don't know which one. Like he's like, Ryan mentioned having cable issues like there's so many i don't even know <laughs> i thought you journaled them uh no a little, like book I, them. I can't i don't <laughs> want to relive those times hdmi oh my gosh it is such a cluster it's it's like usb there's a governing body no mm. so in the home theater space because I work for Mad VR, we encounter a lot of this because we push the HDMI spec to the limit. So what commonly ends up happening is somebody will put in a cable and it'll be fine. 
It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And then envy comes along and then it doesn't work. And it's like being a network engineer in an IT space. You are immediately blamed for mm -hmm. any problem that exists, right? That's where envy sits. So could be cabling, could be the program itself, could be all kinds of different things that are the problem, but the new kid on the block gets blamed. Almost every time this issue comes up, it is either an EDID problem or it's an HDMI problem, like cable problem. And the reason it's an HDMI cable problem is because the spec, like as an example, let's say they were using an Apple TV. What is very common with Apple TV is people do not have them like HDR turned on and they don't realize it's not turned on or and or their dynamic range and frame rate are hard set. So let's say it's hard set at 24p, HDR isn't on, their chroma sampling set to like 420 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, they're now limiting their bandwidth requirement for the cable. As soon as Envy comes in, we have a guide that says go change a guide that says go change X, Y, or Z in the Apple TV. You've now boosted the requirement of what that source is going to need to push to the AVR and thereby to Envy and then to the display. And what a lot of times ends up happening is it falls flat on its face because there's a cable there that isn't passing muster. Something else that we've noticed is, and this is not to pick on JVC, mm -hmm. um, there is an issue and we're still not sure exactly what it is. I've got an independent lab having looked at it. If you connect an NVIDIA GPU to a JVC cable or to a JVC projector and then send anything over like 4K24 and even sometimes 4K24, mm -hmm. it's going to be an unstable connection. And the more bandwidth you require of that connection, the faster it's going to either go into a no connection state or an mm -hmm. out of range state. So if I push 8K over that, which HDMI 2.1 is supposed to handle, Right. It is virtually immediately going to go out of range or no signal. Mm -hmm. So there's just some really, really, really weird stuff that can happen. And Mikey himself says, it hits it on, on point, is cable frequently don't live up to their advertised bandwidth. No, they don't. So find cables that you trust and stick with them. Um, a lot of cables suck, mm -hmm. especially active cables. I've had many problems with a lot of them. The receivers and mm -hmm. the transmitters will get so hot they'll eventually burn out. And I think a big part of it is there's nobody holding these guys to yeah. a standard. There's no testing body that says, hey, you got to pass this test before you can say you're certified. Eh. Guys are just saying they're certified and they're not. Or they're certified partially and they're not meeting the full spec. <laughs> and it's just, they're lying. A lot of them are lying. Yeah. And it's All just not way. worth it. I mean, it's people, you're going to have problems if yeah. you're pushing the spec to a limit. It's going to happen. Yeah. So, and when I was talking with Phil Jones with Sound United, now Massimo, um, he was saying, you know, with short runs, usually isn't a big deal. Passive's you, usually more okay than active. When you start getting into the longer runs, you're 20 foot, 30 foot. Like in my case, my run's 50 feet, goes up in my attic, outside, drops down to my projector. That's a long run. And so running an active um, fiber optic cable cable helps. I haven't had any issues with the monoprice active cables that I use. I just got in two Rui Pro cables. Um, so I'll be testing those. Hopefully those work out great because I, I need to run or I want to run two cables so that I can easily switch um, on the NV, the MavVR NV, like to bypass mode so mm -hmm. I can do my PS5 and just switch the input on my NZ8. Now I wanna make it abundantly clear that what I just went on my rant about was active cables. If you try and do long runs with passive cables, it just no, ain't gonna work. Yeah, don't do that. Right. But yeah. active cables, theoretically, <clears throat> should work over any length, Yeah. as long as the glass is clear and the mm -hmm. signal is strong enough from the, trans from the transceivers to be able to send the signal across the fiber optic. Because mm -hmm. it's changing the signal as it comes in from whatever the source is, and then the trans, the receiver or the broadcaster, whatever is on the source end, is converting it into light and then sending pulses like it would over any fiber optic connection to the receiver on the other end. So you could theoretically have 
a thousand foot cable mm -hmm. if it was strong enough. Why yeah. you would do that, I don't know, but you could. I have a 300 foot one downstairs just in a box, but wow. it's not anything special as long as the it can send that signal. It's good. Yeah. yeah. If it works, like if you don't run into any of the other problems, um, the signal shouldn't fall off. So as long as the um, transceiver is strong enough. So what I've noticed thing. with the HDMI 2.1 is even if you have a good solid working connection, when you start switching clips, like if you're doing demo clips that are recorded mm -hmm. on from a computer, yeah. uh, or af after it switches enough times between like 60 hertz and 24 hertz and HDR and SDR and all that stuff, it's it goofs up at some mm -hmm. point, like every it, time. It's just the whole thing's a disaster. Yeah, it's it's not ideal, that's for sure. How expensive is a 300 foot fiber optic cable? Um, I think an AV Pro Edge is right around a thousand dollars. Ooh, wow! I figure about two fifty for something like that. No. So somebody previously asked, and we didn't even answer it, but about certified cables, is it worth getting it? And my answer is yes on that, mm -hmm. yeah. because it's going to avoid you some headache. You can get a non-certified cable from Amazon, mm -hmm. and it might work. Might. And you might have to run it multiple times or try different two or three different returns before you get one. A certified cable should work every time. Should. 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 But, you're but gonna if have we go back to the HDMI complaints I was making, just because it says certified doesn't necessarily mean that it's certified in everything or even certified at all. I'm with Jonathan, though. I would rather take a gamble on one that at least claims to be certified than one that doesn't. And they have, make sure when you, there's all kinds of ways to spot the fraudulent stuff. They're supposed to have a little holographic image on there that that looks 3D. It's not just a little sticker label. There's, there's HDMI org is supposed to make it so you can feel what's real and what's not. You can see what's real and what's right and not. I can, you don't, you don't think, you don't agree, Ryan? I, I just think that it, do, it doesn't stop anybody from putting that on their packaging. Well, they got to, they're supposed to be buying that sticker, right? Supposed to be. They could counterfeit it, I but suppose. it's such a disaster that I don't know that it's even do it like it's they're even doing it correctly. Like one of the ca cables that I have the best luck with is made by a manufacturer called Geffen, G E F E N, and Geffen. I don't Perfect. even know that they have. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But um, does that one have it? The little I'm holograph trying. sticker in the middle is it holographic? Let's see. Oh, where's your sticker at? You should have a holographic yeah, sticker that's certified. Yep, right here. So right there. Let's see. Don't know if you guys can see that. I don't think it's picking up on the camera. But it yeah, should look 3D as you're looking at it in person. Yeah, when I when I rotate it, it changes from... But see, I've had multiple Rui Pros burn out on me. Yeah. You have? Yeah, the, broad, the good, sending yeah. end has just fried. Mm -hmm. The Rui Pro is what I'm using. Yeah. So like, that, uh, are they using the USB power extension thing in that case? I'm kind of curious about that because, you know, they have that optional. Yes, it USB doesn't power. I mean, it doesn't either way. It, it gets enough power from the up. NVIDIA GPU that it shouldn't need it. Theoretically, I don't use the USB. No, power. You shouldn't really that, need it in uh, most situations. But yeah, I've had those fail multiple times. So that's why I don't really. <clears throat> Rui Pro puts a lifetime warranty on it. So they do. Not, they do. I think it's. I think it's a decent cable. Um, I, my point of this is, is I think they all suck. And here's the other thing, uh, Ryan. You, you probably have more experience with this with your Mad VR and salesman work, but Rui Pro also has their transmitters set to 60 gigabit per second instead of 40, 40 or 48, 48. like a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So they're supposed to have an extra headroom where they shouldn't be hitting that ceiling. I'm not saying that's. Mm -hmm your experience but that's what the marketing claims no i've had the Rui pros i've actually had good luck with right with getting around the problem Rui pro was one of the only cables and geffen that would work with the jvcs right mm -hmm. my problem with them and i haven't run into this with geffen <laughs> with Rui pro and i'm just being candid here guys yeah. i'm not talking poorly about any of these companies this is just yeah. what i've run into with Rui pro is the cable heads of burnout and mm -hmm. i've it's caused me headaches because then i'm sitting there like my connection just randomly doesn't work since I shut it down last time. And it's, I've run cables on the floor right after that. And the cable was dead. So mm. HDMI failures are one of the biggest pain in the asses to troubleshoot in comparison to virtually anything else, because it's difficult to identify where the problem is until you just figure out and have cables available. Cause most people don't have long enough cables to be able to run on the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, 
to be able to test to see if it's a cable problem. And it just becomes this huge nightmare for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, well, think so, about me. I've got to climb in my attic to run these because I don't well, think nobody I... asked you, Michael. So hey, you, I, you back anyway. off. I'll boot you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But yeah, it's gonna be it's hot here in Florida, man. It's, it's hot here. We had a heat here. index today of 120. Yeah. yeah, it's brutal. But I gotta no, well, so wait a second. In your part of the woods, they said 108 <laughs> physical temperature. We didn't hit anywhere near that in, in yeah. Blue Springs. What we did you hit, hit? My son was playing soccer at noon today, and I was looking at my weather station outside, which reading like the humidity and the temperature and all of that stuff, and it showed a temperature of ninety-nine. Mm. And this is when I read it with a heat index of 115. Yeah. Well, they were talking 108 physical temperature. No, outside. it didn't, didn't hit that. Didn't hot. hit that. We were only no. at like 96 when I looked at. The no, we, I think we hit like 100 today. But the the heat index was the humidity disgusting. was nasty. Nasty. Yeah, it was, it like was gross. Outside. And it's supposed to be in the. It's supposed to get hotter tomorrow and the rest of the week. Yeah. So Bruce mentions that the best part is when you don't pay attention and realize the cable is a one-way cable. Like and it's it the wrong way. It has a spin and a receive oh, side. Yes. Yeah. My yes. buddy Nelson installed, he built a brand new theater in his basement, installed the drywall. It was not coming out. Like it was a permanent, and he put it in the wrong way. Yeah. So that, he's like, I didn't know. Guys, in those instances, if you're ever installing cables and you have access up there, put in a Smurf tube. Put in conduit. I need and then run that. a run right. a pull string <laughs> through it. I need to look it up. What? I got to be up there. Yeah, I got to get up there anyway. It's just like orange tube. I know. Why do they call it Smurf tube if it's orange? I don't know. None of these are orange. Oh, here we go. What would you do? Like a, a inch diameter? No, I'd go as big as I can. Because that's three quarters. Inch and a half. Yeah. Anyway, I'll look it up. I've got it on my Amazon. So it's it was called Smurf tube because it was originally blue. There you go. So that's why. Yeah. They still have blue, but that's why it's called Smurf tube. So but if you're going to get up there, Michael, mm -hmm. put it in. Yeah. And then It'd be helpful, honestly. Before you run it, like before yeah. you take it up there, get good pull string, like you can mm -hmm. get it at Home Depot or Lowe's. Sure. Run it through it so that the next time you have to run it, you just yeah. tape on your cable and tie it on and then just pull it through. Joe said he uses two inch PVC. That'd work. Yeah, you could do that. Try and have as very few bends in it as possible. Yeah. That's 45 yeah. degree bends if you can instead of 90. Yeah. If you yes. can. Yeah. You, ideally, you yeah. want them yeah. nice and well, the, With smooth. the smurf tube, it's not even a bend. It's like you just. You yeah, bend. but if the bend is too long, it'll get caught on the ridges and it's just oh, a really? pain in the ass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you end up having to lube them up and so that they'll slide through things and it. Okay. Yeah. Well, you didn't know that that was where the conversation was going to go tonight, Michael, but it did. We just got demonetized. Lubing up some HDMI cables. You, Bruce, you can tape the cable, old cable to the new cable, but it's always best to have multiple options, right? So that if what happens if you're pulling and you accidentally pull too hard, and this has happened. I used yeah. to do commercial electric before in a time ago, mm -hmm. and the cable that you're pulling on breaks mm -hmm. in half. Well, now you're screwed. So... Funny thing is I did a video on it. I, I had my cable literally going along the basement for a long time. Monoprice sent me all kinds of cables and, and I didn't want to climb in the attic, run this thing only to find out in three months that, you know, dies or mm -hmm. the end burns out. So I just left it on the floor for about a year because I didn't want to climb up in the attic. My buddy came down to visit and he's like, you know, there's a really, he, he had a pretty creative way of tying it to it to where it doesn't pull um, on the, what do you call it? The tip? Yeah. The end. So how you do it, and I can tell it people how cool. you do it. I got a is, video on it. Um, I don't have any string. It was a cool little trick, though. It so worked great. you take the string, you tape it onto the back back here, and then you're going to, like, wrap it around once here and then tie, like, your first shoe knot so that it's got like a little, it's not a knot, but it's like how you're doing your laces and you cross mm -hmm. them and then you go underneath. You do that mm -hmm. once here, then you leave like an inch and do it again, mm -hmm. right? Then you put another piece of tape up here and then your pull string comes off the front, mm -hmm. right? So now you're sharing the load on the cable in multiple places yeah. and it's very easy to take off and you don't have to worry about undoing a knot. But yeah. that way you don't have, you're not, 
putting any tension or anything on the head. And when the string comes through, right, if it's up here, you just tape this whole thing using liberal amounts of electrical tape. That way it doesn't so, get caught on something. Right. And then that way, if you go over the head, the head doesn't get stuck on anything. And then you just have a, it tapers down to a point on the string and then you pull it through. And then back here, you just tie on another pull string. So when you pull through this pull string, you're pulling Nothing through goes. another one on the cable. Yep. That's how you do it. Cool. Have you guys heard of that ping pong ball trick? I never heard yep. of that one. Yeah, ping pong ball trick. I don't think you so. tie uh, you like tape a string to the back of a ping pong ball and then create enough suction and it'll pull this ping pong ball through as long as the string isn't heavy enough. Hmm. I've done that one. But the key is to just do it so you don't have to do any of that in the first place. True. <laughs> I just use my lips. That's hilarious, dude. Um, we won't go there. Uh, I saw a couple of super chats. Oh no, that we did that one. I saw another one. Here we go. Eric, appreciate the $10 super chat recommendation for AVR with Dirac and one dual sub out. Uh, so he's got one 18 inch or two 15 inch. How to ensure the best integration of two subs, uh, individual for each sub manually. DSP mini, man, that is a lot of pieces of this or like app for sub and then direct live base. Let that sink in for a second. One dual sub out? That doesn't make sense. All right, Eric, we may need some clarification on here. So my assumption here is that he has one sub out. On his like, current AVR. Yes, that's this is my assumption. You'd need to run that into a mini DSP to break it into two and then EQ them. What I would do is I would break it into two EQ them on the mini DSP and then present that to Dirac right. as one sub. Is how I would do that. You haven't been super impressed with Dirac's base control. Yeah, but my room is really hard. So Bruce, you're cracking me up, brother. If we read this with him, if we take the one out, recommendation from AVR with Dirac and dual sub out, he's looking at 118 or 215s. How do you ensure the best integration if there's two subs? If your if your AVR has two subs out, dual sub out would typically mean two subwoofer outs. Mm -hmm. Just put one sub on each one, especially if they're not equal distant from the main listening position. Yes, and let the and let the processor set the distances and so forth. I don't have any experience with Dirac Live Base, so I can't answer that. One. It's good. I would just recommend presenting, like I think you should in any scenario presenting room eq with one sub it's easier for it to manage the less room eq has to do the better room eq can and will screw up phasing uh, so i don't know i don't know i don't think i agree with you there but go ahead oh I'll, i've had it happen I, well I mean, sure sure it can doesn't have to i'm not saying it has to but the doesn't less even mean it mo most likely will i'm just think. saying that if you can correct this beforehand the less room eq has to do in my opinion, the better the experience is going. So to be. if Eric's asking these questions, he doesn't know how to match his subs together before he runs it through auto EQ. They might be out of phase. They might be different distances. There's a lot of things that go into that presenting a perfect box to mm -hmm. Dirac or to another auto EQ yes. before you get to that point. And but if it screws something up, he's not going to know either. Well, wait a second. So let me give you an example. We were at a local member's house here not that long ago who will remain anonymous, and he had bought three SVS subs and he said, these aren't performing as well as I had hoped. And we did measurements in his room. One of his three was out of phase, and he had them all lumped together. So his three now became equivalent to one and a half. Like buying that third SVS sub brought him down a notch because right. his, no, his now two that were in phase were no longer in phase. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. If you don't know what you're doing to set up that nice package to present to auto EQ software, you're probably, probably better off letting the auto EQ software. Fair enough. But my point is, is if it does screw it up, you don't know that it screwed it up because you can't see it. He doesn't know if he screwed it up if he presented it as package first either. <laughs> but that's why we're going back to getting a, a auto mic for you, or Omni mic or REW or learning some stuff. But it's not that hard to figure out either because if you get like a U mic or I would suggest you get an Omni mic when the new V3 comes out, just see if the summation goes up. Yes. And if it doesn't, change your phasing and yes. then see if it goes down or goes up. And there's, it's probably not going to go up across the entire board. There's probably going to be some 
parts that are even or maybe slightly down. You just got to pick the best of whatever you see and what the summation increase is better on. Um, it's not hard to figure out, but I understand your position of it. Both can be bad. <laughs> Fine. key is measuring and making sure that it's that it's doing the right thing you know if you add a third sub and it you get a decrease in output something's not right so you definitely got to make some adjustments there i love this man why are mom and dad arguing <laughs> nothing more exciting than a good av squabble i love it man that's cool, well, it was, mean, that was good natured we just yeah. politely oh, yeah. disagreed and well, I want obviously to, Jonathan was wrong, so it's fine. <laughs> I want us to feel comfortable disagreeing. And I think in society, we're in we're in a day and age where you can't physically disagree with each other without getting into a fist fight. And that's dumb. You should be able to have your own opinion, have your own experiences, and share that in a way that that the other party or other parties can mutually go, you know, I see what you're saying. I don't agree with you. And I think what you're saying is incorrect or dumb or whatever, but I still respect you as a person. You know, I don't think it always has to end up in a fist fight. Now, if y'all want a fist fight, I'll record it. <laughs> that would be great. We could do that at um, M Wave next year. That yeah. one we would live stream, dude. This that would be paid for after the push-up competition. <laughs> we'll make yeah, that part of the brown note experience. <laughs> yeah, we'll have some fun with that, dude. Mm. That's awesome. All right, let's see if we can jam through some of these. Here, da, 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 da. all right. So Tahoya, Kef got the Dominus uh, certification for their new reference in walls, which I assume was just to convince people that they made a speaker that drivers won't blow at loud volumes. Let's figure that out. Let's pull that up. Kef right. re reference in walls got Dominus certification. That, That's surprising. Yeah, from Kef. Kef Dominus. All right, so it's there. Okay, here we go. So it's a CI five one six zero R E F M CI five one six zero R E F M dash T H X. I'll put it up on the screen here. All right. So this is what we're looking at. Eleven thousand dollars. Lord. Be. I mean, look, you're spending money just for this little cool thing on their website. No, I'm just kidding. Yikes. That's a lot of money, dude. Now this, oh man, that's a janky website. Look, this one won't do it. I like this. Look at there. Ooh, oh, dude, 3D. Man, here, let's blow it up. All right. That's fancy, man. It looks slick. Doesn't have a back box, though. I'm surprised. All right, where are the specs? All right, let's go down. Oop, I didn't want to zoom in. All right, where to buy? All right, so it is THX Dominus certified, handcrafted. You could have just hit the specification button. Was there a button up there? There was. Yeah, but I want to see some cool stuff. Details, specs. All right. So what are we it's looking max at? Max SPL is 116. 92 dB sensitivity. Max X SPL. Yeah, but 116 is not sh shady. It's not. Yeah, but that kind of puts some some knowledge to what dominus means it's not as high as i would have expected really no because dominus probably. is supposed to be like ultimate any size room and 116 only yeah. puts you about 10 or 12 foot away for the fall off at distance mm, that's not true. that's not an enormous room if yeah. 116 is your max you lose 10 db to distance you're at 106 that's mm. not leaving room for eq mm -mm. that's not ruben i mean that's that's dominus may not mean what we think it means Again, they don't they don't post those specs to be able to know what does it take to hit. So them. I just looked at the, I had looked at another speaker mm -hmm. that is THX Dominus rating, and its max SPL capability is 117. Okay, pretty similar. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And the sensitivity is 92. And the sensitivity on the other speaker is 92. Maybe that's the secret sauce. You got to be 92 dB sensitive. 116, 117 dB max SPL. Don't know. Mm. Look at that dispersion. Where are you saying that at? Nominal coverage. 150 degrees. Mm. That's like my CBTs. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Man, so I don't think Dominus is really means anything really 
man, this means something to me. Good night. <laughs> That's a lot. Two thousand dollars for two speakers, and it doesn't have a backer box. That's what I'm surprised. I really am. I'm really surprised. Like that's listen- gotta impact your frequency response in the the consistency characteristics of the speaker from one space to another. Well, it's a cool looking speaker, but man, yeah, that that's hard for me. It's made out of aluminum, eleven millimeter thick precision machine aluminum baffle. It looked nice. Yeah, it's slick. It looks good. Better look good for twelve thousand dollars. I want to hear him. Bring him to M Wave. Well, I can't just bring him. Well, I could, but I'm not going to. <laughs> See, you can't tempt Ryan. He'll go out and buy them. He's like, I just ordered them on Amazon. You got to install it in the convention center on one of the walls between. Can the... I buy them? <laughs> oh, no, don't even look, dude. <laughs> I'm going to find out. <laughs> no, golly, man. Golly. All right, let's keep going. Uh, All right, Ron Bates. Oh, I can. Do you have, oh gosh. Cha-ching. Ron Bates says, do you have any experience using the Anthem Avium 90 preamp, using it for movies and two-channel stereo? Your thoughts on the quality of audio for both? I have not heard the Avium 90. I have the Avium 70 in for review. It's been in for a while. Need to get it set up. For Avium 90 reviews well on ASR, for what it's worth. It reviewed it well at M-Wave with people listening to it in the room EQ room. I think it... If you take room EQ out of the equation mm-hmm. and you take things like Marantz, what is Marantz's thing called? What do they call it? Odyssey? No. The multi HDAM? Uh, yeah, that. Oh, that thing. I got you. I got you. If you take that out of the equation and you're not intentionally coloring things, mm-hmm. they're all going to sound the same, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Would they measure different? Yes. Sure. Yeah. But you're not going to be able to tell the difference. It's so above our hearing threshold. My storm which is probably going to measure similarly, I would imagine, to the Anthem, maybe a little bit better. Sounds fantastic in two-channel. You are not going to be able to tell the difference, in my opinion. It doesn't doesn't matter. So if it excels at one and delivers good sound in one, it's going to do very well in stereo. I don't think you should worry about that. Any other... No, you got mad. I don't want to say anything. <laughs> it will have a, a fit over there. All right, Justin Baker, thoughts on tactile transducers? Any recommendations? And how would I connect it to a 3800H Denon? You guys own them. There's a lot of different kinds. I made a video years ago. You should go watch it on uh, my channel just I'm not Shameless calling myself out. It's just, it's just a good video. It shows a Clark uh, synthesis. It shows a butt kicker mini and it shows an aura. And those are three common models. And I put them on a board and I put a cup of water on the board or a little bowl of water. And I put a piece of food dye in there, a little drip of food dye. And I turned on the things all at the same level. And you watch the water shake around and get colored by the dye. So you can kind of see how they interact. Okay. Um, and it's good in that way. And I'll say just in the general, the aura in my taste wasn't powerful enough to really be worthwhile. Yeah. The butt kicker minis are too small to dig down deep. They bought them out. So skip that one all together and go to butt kicker advance or butt kicker LFE. And that's a good choice. Either one of those. Yeah. And the Clark synthesis makes a little bit of sound. Mm-hmm. So like where the butt kickers should be silent unless it's got a, unless it's bottoming out, it's quiet, silent. Mm-hmm. The Clark synthesis is actually more of like a, a traditional transducer driver and it moves and it makes audio. So, the Clark is kind of more of a, probably more of a natural feel. It's almost like replicating what a subwoofer driver would because it's actually, it actually is a transducer that's moving up and down. Butt kickers are a slug, which are kind of slamming around like they can be violent. Mm-hmm. Um, and the aura is, is kind of more of a flat hockey puck type thing that's moving around. So of those three transducers, they all have a different feel. And I think that video, which has the die kind of shows how they interact with the feel, like you can visualize how it is versus us describing it. <laughs> it's true. I, I never claimed to be a huge video fling, but I think that's a good one to show. There's a lot of other ones. There's Earthquake. There are, uh, what's the one that Clark, no, Co- I'm trying to think of the name of the one that's just moves up and down. What's it called? Uh, it's eluding me right now. 
I only know of the aura and base. Uh, there's Croson. There's aura. that's the one. That's the one. So that one you put underneath the chair foot, and it and it has a really subtle movement. It's lifting you up and down to frequency, and so it's moving your whole chair. There's Mikey different styles. Some, so that'd be your budget friendly ones. Dayton. Which one is it? Dayton. Yeah, the Oro or A U R. Yeah. O A at the end. Yeah, it's like A. They're like fifty dollars, but I, but I would, unless you just want to get a feel for it and you're not really wanting to get a lot of a lot of tactile feel, mm -hmm. I would probably pass on that one to be honest. Yeah. Um. Now, how do you how do you run them? We did another video on this, so scroll back to youth man's videos for this. We talked about how we run them. Many DSP or something you need because you have to get that timing exactly right, down to a hundredth of a millisecond. And you can't do that with the with the definition in an AVR. There there isn't enough granularity to get down there. It's, Some there are, but very few. Yeah, and also we talked about this in that video, so I don't want to repeat it here, but just to give you a taste on the on the tactile transducers with like a slug, like the butt kicker. You have to make them fire before your subwoofers, and you cannot do that with an AVR. So you need the mini DSP to add delay to your real subs, your physical subs, your subwoofers, and then have Subwoofer. the <laughs> have the butt kickers fire a little bit previous to that. So go back to Youthman's videos uh, and look up that tactile transducer overview. We did a really lengthy one on that. Well said. I got to go back to the kef. All right. Go ahead, man. And I think this is a good point. So Ryan brings up, didn't Aaron's audio corner do some testing in that the ones without the backer boxes did better? And I agree. The reason I bring up that backer boxes are important is because you are you make the assumption that everybody's wall cavity is similar. And if it's not, then you can cause things to happen. So in my opinion, while backer boxes can limit some things, they can also provide some level of consistency and not reliance on what is in the wall, how big the space is, and where or the shape of that cavity actually is. So I like them because I think it provides some level of consistency, but I also don't like in walls to begin with. I like on walls. I really don't like in walls because I think you're sacrificing a lot. So going back to Jonathan, uh, butt kickers are worthless? What no, 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 I didn't say that at all. I said the, the, the mini butt minis, they yeah. bought them out too fast. They don't have enough, they don't have enough weight on that slug and they don't have enough power to really get the chair yeah. moving. So you got to step up to the advanced. The advanced, I don't remember the weight of the slug. I'm not even going to pretend I do, but the advanced are a bigger unit physically and the slug is bigger inside that stone wire. And the LFE is bigger yet. A couple the of LFEs can shake about that big, like the end mm -hmm. of the celsius can up here is about that big and the mini is super small it just doesn't mm. have the mass to make it work yeah right so no certainly not worthless uh, let me let me tell you another way cb more uh, on the butt kicker advance if i put that on the carpet and i'm playing like i have a video out there as well for playing bass i love you with the butt kicker advance right. the thing will hop off the carpet like mm. at that low note you attach that to your seat you're gonna feel it so yeah. if you get the timing aligned correctly it feels really it feels really fun and good and adds a lot. If you get the timing bad, it's really will distract you from the movie. Yeah, it's not good. The, movie. the LFEs are actually so large. They kind of scare me. <laughs> I mean, yeah. just having yeah. that amount of mass right under your butt is a little yeah. concerning <laughs> in <laughs> my <laughs> opinion. It's a great danger says Ryan needs to be more positive and stop looking so disappointed. This is just perpetual disappointment right here. <laughs> That's his face, man. That's the resting face. That's yes. just the way he rolls. I'm just in a perpetual state of disappointment, mainly because I'm always around Michael. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, we like to have fun, man. Uh, let's see. Did so this one, I want to speak to this just for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Not good. This is a great idea of very poor implementation. Mm. The reason why is you need that negative delay, and you cannot do it. In fact, right now, they're saying they're going to create it in a future update, but on the Denon and Marantz, the current 2023 oh. generation, there's not even a delay function on the transducers. They only have the, the, the cutoffs, mm -hmm. uh, basically the high or the low pass filters range, and that's it. You need a time delay, and you need, a, you need to send it prior to the subwoofer signal. So it, mm -hmm. it's, that doesn't work. It's terrible. Yeah. They say they're going to fix it. We'll see. They With will. A it's update. a new function. I think it was just some a feature they're adding, and they'll flesh it out. At least I hope mm -hmm. they will. First-hand experience. I tried it because I hoped it would work, and it was terrible. 
CB Moore says, I have to ask, do you guys have isolated power to your home theater? I know you all, I know you all that have big subwoofers likely do, but normal home theater. So in my room, I don't have a, a massive setup. I just have a dedicated 20 amp circuit going to my room. So all of my equipment, except for my projector is on that circuit. Then the lighting is on the normal 15 amp circuit that was in the room already. So the lighting is separate. My subwoofers, the AVR or the processor, the amplifier, uh, my 4K player, the um, ZPD, MadVR, all that's on one dedicated 20 amp circuit. So what are you running in yours? Ryan, you got quite a few, don't you? I think I have five 20 amp circuits. Okay. Do I, I need have... that many? No, but I need them for. Why not? I'd like to have them for the subs. I have two dedicated 20 amp circuits, and that's sufficient for my theater. I've only mm -hmm. thrown the breaker one time in 10 years. I've never thrown a breaker, ever. I have. <laughs> you got weird speakers, though, man. Good question. Man. <laughs> Drexel's Den, I love your video, guys. Can I get your feedback on Home Cinema D Box? Is it mm. worth it? So is that the new one that, that D boxes kind of introduced recently over the past maybe year? No, I think it's the same one. Okay. I know they were really trying to push the, the residential side. Uh, it may have smaller, like more limited throw than mm -hmm. their larger ones. I think their larger ones go up to like three inches and this one maybe one or something like that. Yeah. The, is it worth it question comes up a lot and, a bunch of different avenues of home theater and, and really Drexel. Depends it's hard on for any of us to say what your financial position is. Correct. D box That's is very point. expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have the means to do it, mm -hmm. it is in my opinion, the best tactile transducer. Um, but not only does it do tactile transduction, it also does up Motion. to six degrees of movement, which mm -hmm. is big. Um, especially in simulation. D-Box is primarily used in simulation, and it does a very good job of tricking your brain into movement. And doing the same thing in home theater, if it's done in limited quantities, not going overboard with it, can be very, very good. Mm -hmm. So if you have the financial means to do it, it's very good. Um, yeah. They're probably... Like saying, though, is a Ferrari worth it, you know, for that extra horsepower? Well, it depends a lot on your... Yeah, but in D-Box, you would actually use it. You're not... Most people aren't going to be able to uncage the Ferrari. Dude, I'll uncage a Ferrari in a heart... I'll go to jail, but I'll uncage that Joker. Sure. So I would say yes, if you have the financial means to do so. So I'm a dealer for them if you want to have a conversation about it, but they're not cheap. Do they publish their pricing, Ryan? Can you say their pricing, the, the MSRP, or do they not publish I it? I have never seen their pu their pricing public. I think it's around ten grand a chair, right? Like public price, somewhere in that neighborhood? I'd have to look it up. They're it's not, not cheap. cheap, though. I know that. I know and, and, and there's a subscription fee that you have to pay forever into per perpetuity. For, to get the new movies and stuff. But the other mm -hmm. thing you have to do... To make it work at all. Right? Like it doesn't work if you don't have those files. And I think you need the subscription unless there's some I don't sort of offer. If you need that or not. Like but the says other more the other more right. important the part of it is you have to have chairs that can handle it. Because it's an added stressor on your chair. Like if you have a wood frame seat, probably not a good idea. And there's certain chairs and furniture that is D box certified and they have to do testing and stuff to make sure that it's gonna work. Valencia just got it, Jamar has it. I want to say Fortress has it. Um, I don't know if Row One does, but I know those three definitely do. So, so yeah, so he's right. They do have pricing on their website, but it's like with a chair. So it's ten thousand dollars for a chair. Let me see if I have right here. So like right here, if I click on yeah, right here. So the Jmar Lifestyle One is ninety six oh five for a single chair. And they ha they they have different levels of like the six axis movement, don't they or not? I think yes. I think Tony was telling me they have different like qualities, if you will. Yeah, yeah, you can you do like uh, two transducers, three transducers, four transducers, and it's going to change how you actually perceive the movement. 
you need, if you want full range, you really need at least three. Four is ideal. Mm -hmm. So I haven't experienced it in a home, and I don't know if Ryan has, but Michael has. You experienced it at Tony's house, right? It's incredible. Seriously. Yeah, it is. When done right, it, it's like I wasn't sure. I thought it would be kind of hokey or gimmicky. But one thing I'm learning, the guys that like yourself, Tony, anything can be overdone. Subwoofers mm -hmm. can be overdone. Your height channels or Atmos speakers can be overdone. It's all about calibration. And so if you calibrate it properly and you have just enough of it, it'll bring you into the experience rather than take you out of that movie experience. So it can be done very, very well for sure. I saw it in a commercial cinema one time that had D box and I watched the jungle book, the live action jungle book that came out 10 years ago or something. Right. And I remember it was kind of fun because as he was swinging to the trees, your chair would do this, you know, as he, as he was swinging from branch to branch. And it was, I mean, it, it was a little hokey because it was overdone but at, at that cinema, but it, but it was still fun. Like so it was kind of like neat pricing on a G five haptic system, MSRP for, Two is, transducers. Is that the top system? G5? Yes, okay. Yes. Two transducers is 4900 This is just, this is without the chair. Mm -hmm. Three transducers is 6850 mm -hmm. And then four transducers is 8850 Yeah, so depends on how much movement and the degree and angles. Mm -hmm. So with Tony's, what was nice is... Um, trying to remember the name of the movie but there was a part where you're they're flying and it he just starts to do kind of like a nose dive and the chair leans forward i'm like it was cool i'll be honest with you mm -hmm. it was written now of course in the video in the demo at the very beginning we cranked it way up just for that that so you could visually see the movement that it's enough to almost unbroken absolutely it's one of those things where it can throw you out of the seat almost <laughs> so that you don't want to leave it on. But again, it, it's all about just dialing it in, just getting enough of it so that it adds that movement. Even in the tank scene. Oh my goodness. We were watching fury. And every time the, you know, cause think about it in a real tank, you know, when the cannon shoots, you've got some, I mean like that whole tank is moving and that's exactly what it well, not did. only the movement, the tactile, transducer oh part of it because it's independent on each corner yeah you can directionalize your tactile yeah. in a way that nothing else can so it's if you're gonna do, guys if you're thinking about it and you have the means to do it it's fantastic yeah it's just it's awesome. not cheap sure but this hobby isn't cheap i mean we no know but there are certain things that are on a different level but this um, is d box is amazing <clears throat> Jonathan, going back to, oh, where was it? There was somebody that asked a clarification. He said, I'm not a scientist. Find that one. It wasn't too far back. Um, where's he at? He was asking, how can you add delay? There we go, Bruce. He said, I'm not a scientist or anything, but I don't think you can delay something to ahead of something else. Uh-oh. Well, Jonathan awesome. just had to up and leave. He'd been found out. Yeah. I think your so, mic is turned down a little bit. Minus? Just a tad. Just a tad. Um, compared to Jonathan earlier. Sorry. Is that better? I, I pushed the wrong button on my mouth. So you would have to have a substantial oh. delay enough in all of your speakers to be able to then delay, change the delay on that one. You just Bruce, the way you do it is you delay your actual physical subs. Yes. So so I'll use my mini DSP, and in my case, I apply a 7 or 8 millisecond delay to my physical subs, and the tactile transducers are also hooked to the mini DSP. So as the receiver calculates for the extra delay that I've added in manually in a mini DSP, that means I can move the butt kickers the other direction. I can drop it to like 1 millisecond instead of mm -hmm. 7 or 8. That's how I'm doing the pre-advance. So my near-field subs... They're right behind me, right? They should probably measure, you would think, like two or three foot, four foot, depending on the amp delay. My receiver thinks they're 16 foot away or something like that. Maybe it's 14. I don't remember off the top of my head. Because that delay I added in there, and then I can move the transducers down to one millisecond delay. Does that make sense? Sorry for dropping out. I wasn't scared of your question. No, it's good, man. Yeah, Fury with D-Box is definitely violent. 
Uh, thinking of upgrading from JVC 590 to an MP5. So the MP5 is the new, is that a laser or two, or is that no. a lamp based? Lamp -based? It's the replacement for the M MX5. Okay. Uh, do you guys think it's worth it? I watch movies and some TV. Yes, because the 590 doesn't have very good tone mapping. And the MP5 is going to be brighter. The 590, yes. however, what what is the relation to that with RS numbers? I never remember that correlation. The 590 is going to have better contrast. Is it a is it a low? Is a 590 like a 440 or something or a 420? I don't remember the numbers because RS is a different series. That's the one I'm more familiar with. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think that might be a four series, so the contrast might not be as big of a deal as it would be with a five series. Maybe. But even then, I don't know that you would notice. Mm -hmm. It would be good. I'd rather have the brightness. MP5. Yeah. yeah. Cool. The tone mapping is going to be way better. So Mike has a question here. So, you know, is there a way to AB different room corrections at M-Wave? Yes. We actually did it first year and also this year, but he brings up a great point. Sony has their new 360 spatial. So that would might be something cool that we could, in, we didn't have a Sony in there this year, mm -hmm. right? So maybe we can get a Sony and be able to compare if that. If we do it again. Yeah. That room's really hard to set up. Bob's done a great job. I need to get in there and help him. Um, that room, it's really, there's a lot of work that goes into mm -hmm. that. Uh, let's see. What kind of speakers should we use for surround bed layer and height speakers and voice of God for Oro 3D setup? What kind of speakers? I mean, direct radiating speakers would be ideal. Um, you know, most play, most surround formats are moving away from the like wide dispersion. Um, but as far as I would match whatever your like brand that you've got in your front speakers, if you've got any kind of bed layer speakers or a front LCR. What systems are moving away from wide dispersion? Well, all right. So I say systems. So when you're looking at a Dolby Atmos layout, when you're looking at an Oro 3, so on your surround channels, like back in the day, the concept was use a wide dispersion. And by wide dispersion, I mean, maybe I used the wrong thing. Um, oh my goodness. What does Clips call it? Not why I, I said the wrong thing, not wide dispersion. It's basically like a bipole dipole kind of speaker. Oh yeah. That's what I mean by wide dispersion. Sorry about that. What do they call that? Um, Clips has a specific name for it. Uh, yeah. Moving away from dipole, bipole, but they it's call dipole it and bipole. Yeah, but they, they call it something else. Um, why? I thought yeah, it was don't wide. use those. Yeah, it's not wide dispersion. You really want to yeah, use a point source. Saying. Yeah, that's all I was saying. Like a, a direct radiating speaker, not one that has you know speakers going this way and this way to try to diffuse that sound. Um, other than that, I mean, I would just pick whatever you've got, you know, whatever sound that you're looking for. So... Gertie Music, where can I buy a little stainless steel push button insert for a tray table? I have no idea. I would contact the theater seating company. Yeah, that'd be where so I would go. It's going to be uh, CB Moore. So per listen is limited sweet spot. Listening position would be good. Yes. They're not a wide disper dispersion speaker, so you're going to want to think about your seating layout, right? But a lot of people with their theaters, they don't have five people all the time so mm -hmm. limited dispersion and okay. not having necessarily as much of a room reflection issue can be beneficial is it what you want i don't know but per listens are great speakers i like them so i was correct apparently so they do call it wide dispersion surround technology so yeah it's kind of like a diffused sound bipole dipole so my surround should be direct facing. Yeah. And again, this is, this is something that's changing now that we've gone to immersive audio when you've got height speakers or Atmos speakers or DTS X layouts and things like that. Back in the day, the idea was you don't want to be able to localize your surrounds, your side surrounds, rear surrounds. So they would recommend a lot of times using a wide, what I call a wide dispersion speaker to where it's got drivers firing one direction, drivers firing the other direction. Sometimes they'll change the polarity in there and the, the phasing of it. So it kind of gives this, your brain doesn't know, ex you know it's somewhere back there, 
but you don't know it's right there. So having like a 7.1.4, 9.1.6, something like that, they're moving away from those. And so we're going to more of a a direct radiating, um, what did you call it, Ryan? Point source. Point Point source. source. So, you know, just kind of straight firing without diffused sound. Uh, What would be the biggest change you can make to a dedicated theater with less than a grand? So if you got a grand, where would you put your money? Acoustic treatments. Subwoofer. I think both of those are great answers. I think for in most people's cases, acoustic treatments are going to be and subs, but I think a thousand dollars you can get more out of acoustic treatments than you can out of a sub. Yeah. I think both of them are great because the reality is even adding acoustic treatment isn't going to for the most part affect your subwoofers um frequency response. Depends on what you're doing. <laughs> for the most part, no. Maybe they redo the drywall in their room. Yeah, but not for a thousand bucks. Good luck with that. Maybe they're very handy. No. <laughs> Fowl says, I have a quick question about Dirac. Can uh, can you just run a time alignment, redo to a current one set? I had to move my couch a little bit and the timing might be off. No. Got to rerun the whole thing? Yep. Uh, CB Moore, I'm curious, what field of vision do you guys use in your theater? So I think he's talking about the angle Mm -hmm. of your screen. Um, Mine's off the chart. I'll be honest. I don't know (laughs) what it is, but it's not. My next one's going to be off the, off the chart. I think here's the thing. If you Google it, you're going to find charts that were made a long time ago and they were like, Oh, you need third. What is it? 30 degrees. Uh, Current I think is 40, 40 a little over 40. Mine's like 78. I don't know. It's not, <laughs> it's not that big, but it's, it's crazy. It's like 54 or something. It's, it's quite you wide. You want it to start encroaching into your periphery. Ideally. Yeah. I like it. I want it. I want a immersive experience. Some people like looking at a screen. I want to be, I, everybody that, that sits in my front row, I even ask them afterward. I'm like, was that too wide? Did you feel it was a strain? And every single person says, no, that was incredibly immersive. I felt like I was in the movie versus watching a movie. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what I was after. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bruce said, this is 90 degrees. Holy cow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I don't think he's probably at 90. Maybe he is, but uh, SRW 1000, Gritty Music. Please don't ask the same. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. We try to get to as many questions as we can, asking multiple times. Then what happens is we end up addressing it multiple times because we see it. What are the advantages of having multiple subwoofers placed in close proximity to each other versus having them spaced out? Great question, Matt. Go ahead, Jonathan. That's yeah, how your rooms laid out. It's just simple. So if you have a subwoofer co-located, basically stacked or side by side, you get a six dB boost to the single subwoofer with identical subwoofer and identical amp, just doubled. And then next time you double it, you get six dB again. If they're not, and and there's a little bit of variance to this, but this is rule of thumb. If they're not co-located, like you put one on the left side of the room and one on the right side of the room or one in the front and the back, you're only going to get three dB uh, Mm -hmm. for every doubling. So, and by doubling, we're talking about one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16. So when you get up to the eight or 16 realm, you got to go to 32 to get three more dB from 16. So So that's why way into the realm of diminishing returns. Yeah. So, all right, so address the other one, though. What are the advantages of, of having them placed um, oh, yeah. or spaced out? So you get a uniformity of sound. So if you're taking a frequency response sweep in your room and you have both your subs on one spot, you're going to have generally the same nulls and modes in your room. What that means is the frequency response is going to take a dip or it's going to take a bump because of the wave interactions from the room. Subwoofer waves are very long. They can be 80 or 90 foot long. And where they join or where they bounce off the wall and reflect if the peak of the of one wave coming in matches the peak of another wave coming in you get what's called a mode and those modes are going to and the nulls the nulls are the dips if both dips come in the same place you're going to get more variance in your frequency response as you sit in this seat this seat this seat and then back in the different rows if you place two or more subwoofers in different parts of the room you're going to get a more uniform frequency response it's going to be more of a flat line across the different seats the more subs you add 
the more uh, smooth frequency sponge you're going to get in each seat. So that's that's the two general characteristics. Jonathan, can you clarify the um, the six dB that you were referencing? So he's yeah. thinking when you double the driver, yes, you'll get a three dB, but you're also doubling the amplifier power. So you actually get six dB. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, if you take two identical SVS subwoofers, for instance, and you stat, and I've done this in real life testing back in 2011, 2012, when I was first getting my Omni mic and playing, I stack them up in my room. I had left and right sides. If mm -hmm. I stacked my two PB13 Ultras on top of each other, I got almost 6 dB. It was like 5.6 or something. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was Pretty really cool. close to 6. And when I put them on side by side, I turn one sub off and I turn it back on, it's only 3 dB or 2.9 or 3.1 or whatever. It's, it's generally speaking, those two numbers. So yeah. that's what we're talking about here. There, this isn't like fuzzy math. This is this is real world objective truth. Yeah, yeah, Dan. So you're correct. So it's six dB. If you're using now, if you were using passive subwoofers, then you would only get the three dB. Sure. Because you're not dealt well. I guess no, because you got to power if you're, that. If you're doubling like drivers, so one driver to two, and you're doubling amp, a thousand watts plus another thousand watts. Yeah, you're still identical doing subs. That's yeah. going to, and you stack them. That's if six you did eight. one or the other, it's three. If you do both, yes. it's six. Correct. Yes. Yep. So, anyway, I just want to clarify that for those that are following along. Uh, uh, Mike, I'm trying to blow through these as quick as possible. Uh, so, on Sony's new dual center feature, one above, one under the screen. I think it's great. I just wonder though, because we've always been taught anytime, and maybe they're doing some stuff with DSP. You won't be able that. to tell. I think this goes back to those the same thing of you can measure a difference. You can measure comb filtering, but I don't think you'll be able to detect it. You don't think so? No. I don't know. I think it sort of depends on how bad the comb filtering is. But yeah, I'm, I would agree with that. But I just in, don't know what Sony's doing. To in most situations, I don't think it's going to matter. Yeah. The reason they're doing it is for like large um, like the walls LED and stuff, walls. LED walls. walls. I haven't seen this. What are, could you guys know specifically what he's talking about? So, so putting a center channel above and below to anchor the image into the middle. And they're, I mean, this is a sold product, two center channels that are made for yes. that purpose, basically. Yes. So I've told this story before in our 2015 Kansas City crawl. One of the guys, Randy Bessinger, had a Procilla system. And you know those are kind of like a premier, mm -hmm. higher-end setup with calibrators. you, you got to buy them through a calibrator. I mean, it's legit. He had a, if I remember right, it was a P8 above and a P8 below. I think that's the speaker that they were. Mm -hmm. And and that had comb filtering. I, I went over to his house beforehand, Randy and I are friends, and I wanted to measure. I said, this is, the forum says, don't do this. Right, what, yeah. What, what does this really measure like? And we looked at it, no smoothing on the graph, and it was like this, you know, like super okay. serrated knife edge type thing. Not a smooth frequency response like you would get with a traditional speaker. That said, it sounded great. Can In the 2015 that's, audio that's what, crawl, his yeah. room got, everyone was talking about how great his center dialogue sounded like, and he had above and below. Okay. Uh, so, so there you go. That's so one again, that's something that we hear all the time. Like, Hey, you don't want to do this. Don't, you know, duplicating channels, bad, no bueno, but you're saying in real world testing, we don't really hear that. One room that I did that measurement with. Now, I used a, a center above and below my screen with Wharfdale speakers before I ever had measuring equipment when I was really young in the hobby. And I liked that better, too. So that's two experiences, but only one, for me, one experience measured. I'm seeing Nicholas is saying phase issues with double centers. I mean, potentially. There's all kinds of different stuff. But the question is, can you hear it? Mm -hmm. And in some situations, it may be bad. Yeah. And it is objectively bad. Mm -hmm. But... To us, it doesn't objectively matter in a lot of situations. Yeah, our ears aren't microphones. We got to. Well, that's keep good. that's good to know, though, because again, we sometimes we regurgitate things that we've just been told for decades, and it's like, oh, I mean, because I've always been told that don't duplicate the center channel. You're going to get comb filtering. Bad idea. I've had people now probably going vertical. I would think having two center channels like this would be better than trying to put two side by side. Well, look at it this way. I have that's seven, bad. seven, I have seven center channels mounted to my ceiling and they're not three way centers. They're two and a half way. So there is a level of comb filtering coming from all of my speakers on my ceiling, but well, it doesn't but matter. The, you can't hear it. No, no, no. Here's the thing though. You're each one of your, you're not duplicating the sound. The center itself is creating each speaker has its own level of comb filter. Okay. Cause they're horse. That makes it. Yes. 
Yeah, I was talking about the comb filtering from duplicating information. That's what I was thinking. But my point is, is that if you can't hear it, it doesn't matter. Objectively and technically, it's bad. But if you can't hear it, who cares? I think there are times when you can hear it. And I think that, sure. clip, that, that clip speaker that's super long that has four identical drivers and they're all playing the exact same thing. Yes. An example of comb filtering that's not good. But, mm -hmm. but I think Michael kind of spoke to it. We're more able to hear a horizontal speaker's comb filtering than a vertical speaker's comb filtering. And the reason is, is in order to hear that comb filtering on a vertical, you'd have to be doing this. And nobody does that during a movie. But you, you don't do that? Times, you oftentimes <laughs> lean over to your buddy and tell him something, and you'll, you'll hear a little bit of difference. Box, you. Box, you'd be going up right. <laughs> so, guys, the point of this conversation is if you're doing D box, don't do a top and bottom center. <laughs> and exactly. the other thing is, you could really get the, the phase issues, wouldn't be an issue if you time aligned them. And with modern technology and measurement equipment, you could definitely time align the top and the bottom. Cool. So, CB Moore says mid tweeter, mid another myth. It's not a myth. No, who has the I'm, the name's eluding me right now. Aaron did one. why your channel why your center channel sucks. Mm -hmm. That was a good video, and it explains it. And with objective measurements, right? You can you can take that into perspective. Watch it and see what you think. Yeah. So it's not a myth. It's just can you hear it? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. Uh, is it worth to upgrade to IMAX enhanced AV? I don't think so. Not just for IMAX enhanced. No. Love you guys. Learn a lot every time. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, I still don't think I've seen a single IMAX enhanced thing come on my receiver. Have you guys? No, I mean, you could, I, I could go dig one out, I'm sure, and find and buy a movie for it. But I just casually picking out movies and watching them and not intentionally pursuing it. I've never seen it. So all of the Avengers movies are? Well, are that, is that a re-release? Because I've got a lot of them on Blu-ray. I've never seen that flash up there. I don't know. On your AVR? Yeah, you, on the newer AVRs from Den and Morantz, for instance, they'll, it'll automatically go into that mode if you have a movie with that content. Now, maybe there's some sort of DVD some, or Blu-ray, as it were, 4K, some sort of submenu. Maybe you got to go to settings and turn it on. But oh, it, no. should, it should, mm -hmm. on the LCD screen, read. I'm oh, asking, yeah, it's... maybe you have to turn on and select the specific audio output. Perhaps. Right? Mm -hmm. But it hasn't defaulted on anything I've ever seen. Yeah, Tarhoya says I think it's only streaming on Disney Plus for those. If that's what. Well, that's doing. interesting. I'll go try to pursue that out if there's one out there. So that it sets your crossovers to 70 hertz and all that stuff in the background. That'd be kind of interesting to see. Yeah. Randy says Disney Plus not 4K disc unless newer. Hmm. Okay, maybe check that out. Uh, let's see. Master Juan says I meant for the virtual tour that perhaps the tour could be pre-recorded and then uploaded to M-Wave site so anyone can access it for a fee and at least go into the rooms and see the equipment. Oh. That's what you're saying. I don't know how we'd pre-record that. Yeah. I mean, it'd be it'd almost be like what I'm doing, though. I mean, mm -hmm. because I do that with the brands, and, you know, at least this year I did. So went in there and kind of interviewed them. We did a tour of each room. Randy, do you need high power or large box for a 12 to 8 inch near field sub wondering if i could build a custom box with minimum depth jbl gx 1200 or low end 15 to 18 work how much power so if he's wanting to do a diy sub 18 inches maybe 12 to 18 inches so you so probably recommend bigger than 12 inches right you're talking about near field mm -hmm. i personally haven't experienced a 12 on the floor i only tried a 10 on the floor Okay. We've talked about this before, Michael. Sheldon stuck 12-inch drivers on the back of his chair, like cut yeah. them into the chair, and that works great. Like, mm -hmm. right, you're, you're close enough at that point that the 12 is fine. But 12 mm -hmm. on the floor is probably going to be too low and not big enough for you to get too excited unless you can lift it up. And if you lift it up, now you got a recline problem, right, mm -hmm. which is why Sheldon stuck it on the back of the chair. It's always um, there. Yeah, the bigger the driver, the better, right? We've talked about this before. You get the most feel, the most physical tactile feel if you're within the driver's diameter away from it. So the closer you can put that chair towards or the subwoofer towards your back, the better it is. Do you need high power? Yeah, you need the same amount of power that you need for the front subs because what you're relying on that with that near field sub is the driver's actual co the cone movement. You want that cone to be moving a lot because that's what you feel. That close mm -hmm. proximity is what you feel. So yeah, you need uh, you need a big driver and you need a lot of power. Nice. You need sealed. I'm gonna stand by it. You need sealed for near field. 
Would that be big enough box? 24 by 15 by eight? 24 by 15 by eight. So if you're using a 12 inch driver and it's 15 inches tall, is that what you're talking about? Are you talking 18 with a 24 inch tall? There's no way you could do an 18 with an eight inch depth. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. So he's, shallow. You if you're on the couch, Randy, and you can get that 12 right up to the back of the couch, it'd probably be okay. You just want that driver cone really moving and you want it close. If you're on a recliner, unless you mount it to your chair, I don't think you can get a 12 close. What I think he should do maybe instead, if he's limited on space, is just direct attach those JBL GX 1200s underneath his seat. Yes. And go open baffle, and then he doesn't have to worry about a box, and then he could run them super low and get some. You'll have to raise the seats in all likelihood, though, because those 12s, the JBL 12s don't have a, they're not shallow. Yeah, but it depends on his seat. If he's a couch, it's not a big deal. But if it's theater seats, yes, probably. Yeah, I mean, Randy, I think we I, uh, you follow up with me on AVS form if you want, or on Discord or something. I, I we've talked before on there. I it I just think you in. really need that thing really close to you. So if you're gonna do a twelve wedge shaped box close, that'll work. If, if it'll fit your recline when you recline back, it'll work. I mean, mm -hmm. I felt the twelves. I felt those exact same drivers over Sheldon's, and they're great, right? They as long as it's close enough, they'll do good. But on the floor, I don't think so. There you go. Chris is saying he's mounted to the backs of your seats. Now follow up, Chris, and say how you like it. There you go. So CB Moore, off-topic question. Really, it's not. Um, do you guys do 16 by 9 or 2.35 to 1? So my room is scope. I have a 2.35 to 1. Jonathan, yours is 2.35 to 1? Mm -hmm. And then so Ryan is, is a 16 by 9. I'm 16 by 9, and I'll go, I'm going 2.0 on the next build. So 2.0? 2 to 1. 2 to 1? Oh, wow. So that would be even wider than, oh no, that wouldn't be It'd wider. It'd be wider. It's in between 16 by nine and two, three, five. Okay. That's for sure. I'll be right back. Yep. Um, my preference is mainly, anyway, I've got a, a video on this on kind of my thoughts behind that. I went with a 2.351, couple of reasons. Number one, that's the primary aspect ratio of, of the content that I view in there. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I optimized for that. The other thing, I don't watch any sports at all. I do some gaming and that's always in 16 by nine, but that's fine. Um, the other thing is I, I wanted a different experience when you come into my theater room and watch a movie. I just didn't want a big TV and, you know, in the living room, you've got a 16 by nine screen. That's what our eyes are used to. I want people to, to see something visually completely different than what they're used to experiencing. So that's why I went with 2.35 to 1. But it's not the ideal aspect ratio for everybody. you got to figure out what works best for you. What you got, buddy? So these are those drivers that you guys are talking about. Uh, it's backwards. It's down. Oh, yeah, there you go. GX 1200. Um, I was just going to pull one out of the box to show you the depth of it. Mm -hmm. I bought six of these in the last sale to see if I had any purpose for them. They're not small. They're not no. huge, but... Right. To put that open baffle under the chair, you'd have to you'd have to raise that chair probably eight inches. So is mm -hmm. that okay? Otherwise, you're putting on the back of the chair, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's probably the easier route. Would you pay like seven bucks a piece for those? <laughs> yeah, thirty. They're like thirty bucks. That's, that's the best awesome. deal in audio right there. And people yeah. bought uh, like Brian. How many did Brian buy? Ryan, did he buy like fifty that's of them or something? Yeah, I mean, I bought six, but he's doing a full on array. Yeah, he's making a literally his front wall is gonna be nothing but these, and yeah. then uh, you know, that's it's only a 12, but you get enough of these things and they'll do anything you want, yeah, yeah. So, kind of going back to the screens, um, what's the benefit of a 2 1 screen? You'll be getting bars, you, you on really only want to do that if you have an NV, okay, because I can manipulate the screen using cropping and stretching to make any content fill the entire screen, and because it's a middle ground between 16 by nine and two, three, five, it stretch. minimizes distortion and allows me to utilize the entire screen space at all times. That makes sense. Yeah. That's why I'm doing it. So Joe, you mentioned the wall space should dictate the screen you use. And again, I don't, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. Um, even if I had, so my cabinet, the way we build it, we, we knew that we were going to do a scope. So we put some decorative stuff up there. But let's say I didn't do decorative stuff above that. 
I would have the height because I've got 10 foot ceilings. I could easily do a 16 by nine screen in there. I still wouldn't have went with a 16 by nine screen, even though I've got the height. So I think it really, it's just your use case scenario. Um, and you got to figure out what works best for you, what kind of content you're going to watch. But I know I've heard the, the argument, you know, if you're, if you're with uh, limited, then go with this type of screen. If you're height limited, go with this type of screen. Again, I, I think it's really just a preference. So, uh, Dave says, will the Denon 4800H four independent sub outs give me enough control over delay and stuff to run near fields or do I need a mini DSP? Kind of talked about that earlier. There's not a lot of adjustments, right? For the, um, to do near fields with that correct right so, yeah we spoke to that earlier in the podcast yeah. okay use a mini dsp uh Ender robinson have you seen any videos from the youtube channel theater advice he has multiple multi videos on 16 to 9 is always better if you do disagree with him in the comments he tells you how much smarter he is yeah i'm not going to follow somebody's channel that that talks down to people because they disagree obviously, but i'm not familiar. obviously you're wrong <laughs> obviously <laughs> uh and i'm okay with that larry says anthem makes great products i have heard great things about the avm 90 have an mrx 1140 and love it arc also works really well mike uh hey guys how about sony's new we did that one um uh, medi thoughts on the rc64 3 so version 3 clip center channel youth man i currently have the rc450 uh let's see looking to upgrade my center something cinema quality any suggestions willing to explore brands so here's the thing when you say you're willing to explore brands i'm assuming you have clip speakers already if you're wanting to move away from that fine but i would not recommend like mix matching trying to find let's say an arendelle center channel and, and partnering that with your clips towers if that's what you're saying that you know I wouldn't recommend that. If you want to switch to another brand, nothing wrong with that. The 64 is a great center channel. It's not the best center channel in the world. One of the, the I remember when I reviewed the 64 three and about the same time I had the SVS um, ultra, I preferred the ultra better, but I, and now it's interesting going the, the comment that I made when I reviewed it was the dialogue was just really, really good on it. Uh, I remember watching The Greatest Showman, and it was just, it was really done very, very well. But kind of going back to Jonathan's thought earlier, talking about Aaron's video, he's got one called Why Center Channels Suck. And looking at the design, there's two different philosophies there. So the SVS Ultra has the two mid range on the outside, or I guess the woofers on the outside. And then they have a tweeter and then a mid range vertically right in the center. And so uh, apparently as far as Aaron's measurements, he's saying that that is a better design than to have a tweeter and then four woofers kind of flanking that. So um, I still think that RC64 is a great center channel. How much it difference is going to be over the 450. I don't know. Cause I haven't heard the 450. Uh, so many good subs out there. My dedicated theater room is 29 by 18 by nine. Uh, how many and what size should I go with? With a twelve to fifteen thousand dollars sub budget, that's good. Man, fifteen thousand dollars, twelve thousand dollars. So he could get three or four subwoofers that are three thousand dollars each. Put one in each corner. I think I'd try a couple JTR ULF four thousands and call it good, mm. and I'd, and only upgrade from there if you need more because they can those can literally break your drywall and. I, and yeah. That's not exaggerating, like not not being facetious. If you turn those up, you can break drywall. And they kind of act like a sealed sub down to their fortune. Yeah, they're they're good to ten hertz, and ten hertz is plenty low. Sure. Yep. I only have five of them. <laughs> <You're insane. laughs> I'm not the worst offender though. I know. Mark has seven. I'm going to Scott movies. He's Scott has six. Yeah. I mean, I'm the low man on the totem pole when it comes to five thousands. <laughs> You're slacking. But I, I'd say get if you want to spend all of that, get three five that get three four thousands and be done. Start with two. You don't even uh, start with two. Start with two. Okay, fine. Start with two, and then upgrade if you want more. The hard part with that is you got to wait another two to three months. Yeah. For another. Eventually, he's going with a Croson transducers on his media couch. I mean, come on. 
you have to have the tactile feel with the sound of that tremendous bass, don't you? Yeah, I mean, there's, another there's weight there's on the crosses that, that provide tactile bass. So, yes, but you'd be ripping your foundation apart for what yeah. the crosses are delivering. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, they're they're definitely cream of the crop, man. Upgrading from a receiver to a processor soon. Wanted to know your thoughts. AVM 70. I know that you have it at the moment. <laughs> I have it. I have it. <laughs> Dude, I've just got so much going on in my life, man. I'm, I'm literally, companies are reaching out to me, like Power Sound Audio. Um, you say, hey, Michael, hope you're doing well. I'd love to send you, you know, some of my products. I'm like, Tom, I appreciate it. I'd love to hear them. But honestly, I'm just having to say no for a while. I've just got so much going on with Scott Newby. I'm doing that. Just got back from Audio Advice Live. Just got back from Atlanta Home Theater. I've got Cedia, 10, probably 10 to 12 videos I'll be making there for different brands. Um, lots of stuff. I just got Atlanta Home Theater reached out to me today and said, hey, I saw your video. I need to get you back out to my place because I've done some major changes. Uh, he just bought a Christy, dude, for his house. Who did? Alex. Oh, he did? Yeah. Mm. So, so he's making some changes. So um, so just a lot going on there. So I'm having to kind of hit, I say hit the pause, but yet I just got a, a full system, almost a full system from Arendelle. I've got the um, HSU uh, VTF 15 that just came in. It, there's so much, man. It's, it's crazy. I got to get on it. I'm trying to crank them out as quick as possible, but really until I hire an editor, man, it's, it's just, it's a grind because you're having to film, edit, review, travel, film, edit, review, and you're doing it all on your own. And then on top of that, we've got M wave. Uh, Ender, do you have any experience with the Epson? I'm not familiar with that model. PU 106 W projector. That seems like a professional nine. projector. What I feel like we looked that up maybe in a podcast past. Yeah, I don't It was I like know. four or five thousand lumens and okay. it had um decent uh, like like the high rated laser blacks that Epson provides. Okay. But we were curious if it was actually like the ultra black, mm -hmm. like if it was legit dark or if it was more like a four thousand series or non ultra black. And I think I think the answer fell on the non ultra black. I think I've been reading that on the forum. Um super bright, not the best dark level performance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um Mike Larry says, so this brings up a question for me. I have Paradigm Founder Series for my LCR and will upgrade my surround soon. Paradigm offers uh, only dipole surrounds, which is their monitor three. Should I look at JTR HT110s? So again, that's the dilemma. Some companies are only making the wide dispersion type dipole surrounds. So apparently Paradigm is doing that as well. But he doesn't have to use those. You can also do paradigm bookshelves and just put them on the true the um, yeah, wall mounts it, that allow them to sit on them. Yeah, because the HT one tens they're not small. No, you know. So if you got room for that, you probably would have room for the bookshelf speakers. From so paradigm. don't don't think just because you're doing it in a surround application that you have to use a surround speaker. Mm -hmm. Some people use towers. A lot of times, your bookshelves, your towers are going to be much better. I mean, look at what Jonathan and I have done. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got, I have center channels on my ceiling. Yeah. Well, you can't oh, see. You your... can't see them here. <laughs> um, but Jonathan's got seventy J ones on his ceiling and surrounds. Yeah. So it's, it's all about just using what you think is the best speaker for the application, yeah. instead of doing what the company tells you is a surround speaker. Surround those dipoles and bipoles are typically now recommended in a situation where. The speaker has to sit very close to you right in order to create a more diffused and unlocatable admittance point. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's better to use something like that than a bookshelf. But for a traditional, if the speaker's far enough away from you situation, a bookshelf is going to be a better option. Yeah. Or an HD 110. They would both be good, but I would not do a bipolar dipole unless you need it. Okay, Mehdi has a good question. Acoustic treatment, start with the front wall or rear? I started with my side walls, actually. I did my side walls first, then my rear wall, mm -hmm. then my ceiling, and then behind my screen. So my front wall was actually my last um, to add acoustic treatment. I, don't know I would probably do first reflection points in the rear wall. 
Yeah, that'd be your side and rear. I would do different than that. What your sidewall you your sidewall suggestion is good, but one of the rooms that I was in years ago subscribed to the theory of dead front live back. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of stuck with me all these years later because he had some very nice speakers, triad mm -hmm. gold. Yeah. Um, and, and his front wall, he had 12 inches of insulation up front. It was actually ripped blue jeans in like yeah. big homemade bags, do it yourself bags, basically. So here's the wall and here's 12 inches of blue jeans, dead mm -hmm. front. Right. Like so, hung like boxing bags back side to side, to side, to side, all the way across the front sound stage. And the back was nothing more than just drywall. Mm -hmm. and so you sat probably maybe a third point in the room, like maybe you were in the front third of the room. The back was very lively. The surround field was very lively and the front was real dead. So you didn't have any echoes hitting that front wall or anything. Anything that came forward was absorbed. Right. But the back was really like you got a, a big sense of, of the surround field back there because of all the reflections. And I that stuck with me all these years. That was probably 10 years ago I heard that room and and I thought that worked really well. Yeah. For 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 really going all out on the front wall and doing nothing in the back, it worked really well. Mm -hmm. But it, it's one of those things. It's hard to do just one or the other. I mean, you really got to treat, um, to me, like, like Ryan said, the first reflection points, that's going to be, I think the, the area that you're going to hear the most difference. Um, and then go from there. I think probably and there's going to be some subjective subjectivity to it too. Sure. And that's okay. Yeah. I'm not sure I heard much difference adding it to my ceiling. And even when I measured it, I didn't really see a whole lot of change in that. But a lot of guys will say, hey, yeah, uh, you definitely need to do that because it's a hard surface. Master Juan, Jonathan, how would you connect two center speakers to an AVR or amp or a combination of both? Many so speakers. there's a right way and a wrong way. <laughs> I did it the wrong way and it still was my <laughs> preference. Like when I was like when I said I was green in the hobby, I just I just split the wire, right? I ran the red wire two speakers, Blasphemy. one above and one below. There was no, there was phase issues. I'm sure they weren't exactly equal distant from my ear, but I still liked it better than a single center speaker. And that time I was using MTM. They were Wharfdale Modius or something like that. It's been a while. Wharfdale Sapphire, even I don't remember which ones I had for that. At any rate, even even wrong, I liked it better than just a single center. The right way to do it is to be have some sort of processing where you can do the timing alignment and and that affects phase, right? So you get the exact same timing for both speakers and you get a nice impulse response where they sound arise at the same time. And that would be that would be the ideal way to do it for a single row. Um, if you have a, a back row and a riser, you're gonna have a problem with that because now you're definitely gonna have comb filtering. Mm -hmm. Here's a real quick question. Techie B says he's got the new Klipsch RP 1400 SW. How do I make it hotter? So boost the base, increase the gain knob on the sub, or should it go into the uh, like the AVR and increase the levels there? Like, what's the best practice there? You should not increase the level on the AVR past say negative three for a traditional system, and maybe negative six or negative seven for a high channel count system. And the reason is is because you're redirecting bass from your speakers. Traditionally, if you have like an eighty hertz crossover you're redirecting from those speakers to your subwoofer channel. And the more speakers you have, the more bass is being redirected. So you don't want a positive subwoofer trim on the AVR because you could do what's called input clipping. So at a, at a certain point, most people would say like no higher than negative three on your subwoofer channel. And then, mm -hmm. you, and then you adjust the gain knob on the back of the subwoofer amp to get the volume that you want from there. I think I'm at like that negative... I know at one time I was at negative 10 on my subs. Yeah, I like hovering there because it gives you room to pop them up if you want without worrying about any clipping. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Like, honestly, guys, I think, I mean, I don't know we've probably got a couple of questions. That, um, I've had multiple people contact me and ask us if we could do a video on gain, how to set your gain with different types of setup. And then maybe we could, we could plan on doing that at some point, a question of the night or something and kind of talk through it because... There's a lot of people that don't understand that, and it's not super complicated. It just needs an explanation, and we can probably give that. You want to do it next week? Sure. That'd be well, fine. Let me, a second. Uh, let me see. You're going to be at Scott's. That's what I'm trying to see, what day I come back. My flight comes back on. And you guys can we, – we may just say if y'all set it up, and y'all do it if y'all want to. There's no reason why you can't. Yeah, I get back on, yeah, Sunday. So I get back at 6.35 p.m. Honestly, I'll probably be back by then. There's no way. 
Why? Oh, 8 p.m. your time. Yeah, you could. You no, could I get. It. I get. Yeah, I get back at 6:35 in Tampa. Um, I'll be driving home 7:30. It'll be close, but I may be like sliding in. So if you guys want to go ahead and start, and I'll just jump in when. Um, maybe I'll just set it up early before I leave, so I don't forget. But yeah, if you don't mind, Jonathan. Um, lead that discussion. That'd be awesome. Sure. I'm all about helping you guys out. And Cool, man. Well, I think we've covered a ton of questions tonight. You guys asked some great stuff here. I uh, always do. Yeah, we answered. Man, there's a lot of stuff. We, I bet we go through 50 questions. I know we go through at least 30 every single night that we do this. So Bruce has asked us when we could answer it real quick on this particular one. So how far back do you need to have the rear subs before they don't act like near field was the original question that he posed previously. Okay. And it's that, it's that same answer. If you go walk next to your subwoofer when it's playing, you can feel the point where it starts like shaking your pant leg a little bit more, where you feel the energy from the sub more so than the seats. Mm -hmm. So I often say this, and this is real world experience. I put seven of my eight subwoofers on the front wall and I played them at the same volume as one immediately behind me with near field. And that one immediately behind me with near field had more tactile feel than wow. all seven up front when I turned the amps on and off. So there's something really to the amount of feel. If you move that 18 inch driver that's near field to me back three feet, you don't have near field anymore. Mm -hmm. It's going to behave just like the front wall subs. It doesn't have hardly any of that feel. So mm -hmm. that, that near field experience, that's the definition. It's got to be, Loosey goosey, it's got to be within the driver diameter from your back to feel. And the closer it is, the more you feel. Yeah. I like it, man. Good stuff. Well, guys, we're going to call it a night. We're at two hours and 41 seconds. If you, if you enjoy this kind of content and, man, hit the like button. I don't know what it does, but hit it. <laughs> does something. And thanks for this mic setup, guys. This is yeah, dude. You sound it. awesome, man. And you look professional, bro. <laughs> I love it. You're gonna be doing these podcasts on your channel too sometime, man. Maybe so. Yeah, dude. You and Sheldon, y'all killed it that one day. I think well, that was we remember fun. we were only giving it for him to test. We need it back next weekend. <laughs> it's a review. You need to review Box it. it up. That's right, man. Uh, we're we're excited for you, man. Cool guys. Well, we'll end it here. Hope y'all have an incredible week. And uh, don't forget, we've got dates for M-Wave 2024. Why did I? Okay, I see what I did. Let me change that real quick. That should say, join us for M-Wave 2024. Pop that back up there. Dates June 21st through the 22nd. I'm sorry, 21st through the 23rd, 2024. It'll be at the Kansas City Convention Center. We don't have the, um, I've got to do a lot of work on the back end get all the shopping carts set up for all the, the things. Uh, I might even look at something different this year, like using Eventbrite. So definitely I got some stuff to figure out on that, but at least wanted to give you the date so that you can mark that on your calendar. So love to see you come out, hang out with us. And speaking of the show, I've still got some used gear that needs homes. Okay. So what's the best way to do it? Just reach out to you on the website. Yep. So I've got Perlison, S4Bs, JVC, NZ7 demo. There's an Denon A1H. There's some miscellaneous speakers. Uh, Integra, AVR. There's some stuff that needs to find homes. And if you need anything else outside of that, we can make it happen. JD, the expert, love to have you and your dad join us, man. Yes. Be super cool. Love to meet you. All right, guys, we're going to end it. Y'all have a great week. Later. See you guys later. Have a good